Welcome to the Thursday, December 10th, 2015 Hopkinton School Committee Special Meeting. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. So on our agenda, we start with special meeting budget presentations. Because it's a special meeting, we do not have um, public comment. I'm thinking that must be the reason. There's no one here from, <laughs> from the public. Um, in any event. And then we will move on to old business. We will prioritize our capital requests. And then we have a public comment on here after that old business, adjournment, and our next meetings. So Dr. McLeod, if you'd like to start um, with the budget presentation. Yes, so uh, this evening we're delighted to have um, the elementary principals and director of special education here tonight to review their their budgets. Um, we're, yeah. we're going to begin with the center school. Uh, we were just having a little sidebar here because in the past we've had all three principals come up together. Um, but I think that given our special guests that we've invited this time around and we're, in, we're expecting another one, um, that we will ask you to come up one at a time. Um, and I'm just wondering where the best place will be for Lauren to sit. Do you want her to sit? Can she pull up a seat beside you, Ralph? Sure. Perfect. So, Mrs. Debo, thanks for being here, and uh, we'd love for you to join us up here. Sure. And Lauren, I'll turn it over to Lauren. I have a summaries to share with you. Oh, okay. Okay. You never know which way to look <laughs> to the TV. Yes. Right in the camera. Okay. Sorry, in the mall right now. But then, I, but then I, Okay. It's Hello. just all awkward. Okay. Thanks, Thanks. Hello, good evening. Hi, good evening. <laughs> Hello, Ralph. So I am here to present the center school budget for FY17. It's hard to believe that we're here already. I mean, the year has just flown by. Um, but as we look towards next year, something that um, I think you've noticed from reading over the executive summary, it, it really is a needs-based budget. When we looked at what where we have come over the last few years, where we are moving towards, it really was priorities and what are essential needs. So I will begin by just sharing what our projected enrollment is for next year. NASDAQ just released their recent um, projected enrollments in November. So it's fairly consistent with our current enrollment. Next year it's projected to be 440 students, just a handful less than what we have now. Um, fairly consistent class size. We will maintain 11 first grade classrooms. Um, with 21 students in the class. In kindergarten, our full day kindergarten program, we will maintain our 10 classrooms, 20 students per class. When we looked at what were those essential needs we had for the building, we really took a look at our school improvement plan, which follows in alignment with the strategic plan. Goals that Center School has been working on is adjustment to practice, and we will continue to do that, looking at um, our data and assessments with students and how we are best supporting student needs. So that really fosters the, the workforce, workforce capacity and how are we doing that, as well as student growth. So in terms, we're, we're looking at student growth on a grade level, on a classroom, on an individual basis, and making sure that we are moving students forward in that direction. So to help support that, as we look at our personnel sar summary, our first item that we um, have identified is a shared literacy coach. A coach, think of it as a sporting coach. You know, they're teaching you how to play the game so that you can become an expert player. Um, many of you have young children that play soccer. You see the progression through the introduction of the sport, um, through when they're, they're a varsity letterman or woman in high school. A literacy coach would be embedded professional development. It would be someone that would help us adjust that instruction to practice in a reduced manner that is on the spot, if you will. I currently meet with PLCs for benchmark data review, progress monitoring review, 
When we have that set up multiple times over the course of the year, a literacy coach would also, in addition to that, do so with greater frequency as well as model lessons, how, be the literal coach of how is it that you can do this and per, put the guide on the side um, supporting for that and again that would be a shared position with the Elmwood School. Uh, the second request that um, Center has presented, we have a number of students transitioning from preschool to kindergarten that require the intensive um, special education support setting. Based on those number of students transferring growing up, um, we need to enhance our teaching staff in that capacity to meet the student needs. The role of an intensive teacher is quite unique and dynamic. They communicate with parents daily. We have data collection that is ongoing unlike any other position in the district. And the educational programming is significant because these are the children that require the greatest adjustment and modifications to their educational programming. The last request that we have put forth for a personnel summary is a BCBA for center school. A BCBA is a board certified behavior analyst. We currently share that position over three programs throughout the district. It is an asset to be able to address and support that social emotional behavioral area of child development, especially at our level. We welcome 200 plus children a year but they don't come with blueprints. So when we are working on functioning in a class with 20 other children, children respond differently and in terms of how best to meet their needs and if someone is having a difficult time how best to support that and a BCBA that is the, their realm of expertise in terms of supporting so that that child can be successful mm -hmm. have a positive experience mm -hmm. and they can transition to school with great success. Mm -hmm. A behavior analyst also has an expertise in data analysis and many other functions. Mm -hmm. They would be able to facilitate with overall classroom structure, management, direction. <coughs> Excuse me. So if they were not working specifically with a handful of children or classroom teachers, their, their expertise would be used in multiple capacities. I don't think that they would ever um, have a need for what to fill um, their time with. That is all that we are at looking for for our personnel summary because I think um, we're being very mindful of where we are. We are in a great place in terms of our teaching staff. We're looking to enhance and support that. For the expense summary, as we look at adjusting practice and meeting student needs, there is an area that there is a gap instructionally and that is for that phonemic awareness instruction for our students. So as we've looked at areas that we're working on addressing to promote that growth, we have looked at and identified a research-based program that would help address those needs in a sequential manner that is building upon the um, base skills from early emergent skills to fluent reader skills in a consistent manner. Our teachers are currently working very hard pulling things together, but it is not consistent across the school. And for us to make that growth that we're looking for, we need that united approach in terms of meeting those student needs. And Lauren, I, does that sit in, uh, <coughs> in your uh, ELA textbooks? Is yes, it does. Yeah. So on the, the budget, that looks um, quite significant from years past because I believe it was even um, zero so now <coughs> that that is what that would support for 21 classrooms so when you look at a uh, full um, curriculum materials and, and support for that that does support 21 classrooms if I may I would like to point out that the uh, two positions uh, the intensive uh, learning specialist uh, excuse me the intensive special needs teacher and the BCBA although they would be um, stationed at the center school are not part of the center school program budget they are part of the special education program budget and you'll be hearing from the director about that later so just one bit I wanted to add as we looked at our overall budget and being mindful while it does not wash out as a net um, you know in the positive side looking at line items for our general supplies that we did reduce we didn't just roll over this is what we ordered this year so let's put the same amount in the FY 17 so we did have savings in that area however with the phonemic awareness program 
that cost more than the general supplies we were able to reduce. But we certainly made that effort for that. So, you guys questions? Have questions, Lauren? You guys have oh, absolutely. Questions? Just to remind people, and I'll, I'll pass this out, I did send it to you electronically. Um, just reminding you that this is already, we've already gone back a second time. So, the, the discussion, the original, uh, the comparison is on here for the original request and then going back, Lauren going back and digging, as, as has everybody, deeper, um, so that we have gone from an original 7.4%, 4.6% increase to what is now around 4.31. Still a work in progress, and as we work through this, you know, clearly um, before we come to our final recommendation in January, there can still be additional changes and based on your questions and feedback. Um, but I, I'm going to also pass this around um, so that you know that, that we've, we've already done that piece with Lauren as well. So Brian can have one. So do you guys have any questions? Or do, Brian, do you want to start? Am I allowed to start? Sure. Go for it. I took um, well, the personnel summary, the three positions that you mentioned, do those uh, individuals that fulfill those positions, do they interact with teachers only or do they interact with students and teachers? Both. They will interact with students and teachers. So what, what for the BCBA, for example, if a child is having difficulty, say they're in um, a mode that's requiring de-escalation, de it's going to be first to get a handle on that situation, regulate the student, work um, to getting to that calm place, and the goal is to teach the, um, build the skill set of that teacher so that they are able to do the same. We have children whose school is a really um, brave new world for them and just how they react it's all um, quite different and it sometimes is different than you anticipate some of them are children and what's important to note is that BCBA would support all teachers and all children it is not specifically a special education position um, we have children that encounter difficulties and if we're able to support them they do not require special education services so I think that is a, a significant takeaway so those roles and the literacy coach would also work with um, students as well providing that modeling the direct instruction I do we do you do for this is how you do it for someone who's having difficulty grasping a concept um, in literacy the teacher the literacy coach would be able to go in to model that coach the teacher watch the teacher teach a similar lesson and provide that feedback are they considered administrative positions or are they considered <coughs> positions? I would not think that they would be administrative. No, okay. Right. All right. Good within, answer. They're within the association. <laughs> so they fall under the teacher's union, union contract? Yes. yes. They yes. Fall within teacher's under the union. union. So that means they would not evaluate them but provide support for that. And that would help foster a trusting relationship. Okay. Brian, I think on some of these positions why it seems a little different, we're trying to leverage to get a little more out of these. So rather than just coming in and meeting the students' needs today, our, our thought process on this has been both with the list literacy coach as well as some of the behavior folks is we want to be able to train staff so we, we can increase everybody's expertise and so that we can not only meet the student need but enhance our teachers' abilities as well. So that's why they seem a little bit different, but they are fully in the teacher's contract. So I know nothing about education. I like what you're talking about here. Okay. It sounds like it makes, it makes sense. I just ask it sort of from the oh, sure. perspective. Um, I'm not going to question the sort of educational merits of what you're trying to do at all. I hope not. So tell me about the dollars that were saved in these supplies. How <coughs> many dollars were saved? $8,338. So, but, but because of the phonemic awareness, um, you know, addition, it doesn't necessarily come across, but I thought it was important to mention that we didn't just shift from um, left to right. So it wasn't budget just because, it was budget to what you need. Exactly. Love it. Mm -hmm. All good. Thank you. I just, my last comment for you, Brian, was, um, and thank you again for being here tonight. This is really helpful to us in our process. Um, that you hear this de this level of detail of conversation, but what what has been something that's been really important for us in our work at the lower elementary level is prevention. Mm -hmm. So we want to do whatever we can at that very beginning, those first years of development, to make sure that kids are really starting their careers at the very best place that they can be, and that's you know consistent with the full day kindergarten and, and improved curriculum in those beginning years, consistency across what everybody is getting. And then this piece where we're working with little people with, with some pretty significant behaviors, if they are in the classroom all day long, 
there are certain skills that teachers need that are new to them because these are new problems. Um, and it's, it's consistent with that, that really that vision of prevention um, or philosophy of prevention versus remediation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Great. So I um, feels, look forward to 2018 when we don't have to ask this question every year, which is that if I look at <coughs> kindergarten, um, 20 students per class at projected 204, which means we're an overage of 10 kids away from getting a 21. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do we, uh, are, is there anywhere to go? Space? Yeah. No. Okay. <laughs> So um, so that's being mindful of it um, because you would want it to be a quality classroom. Right. It w could it be in a hallway or a nook? But it would not be past code. It would not be conducive learning environment. So in terms of adding a classroom, we truly don't. Um, we have classrooms, it's good for you to know, where we have two ELL teachers, um, a math tutor, and another staff member sharing a space. And that's also the literacy closet for the, the 21 classrooms to go and seek out leveled material to work with their students. So that's one space. I share an office with the assistant. And it's probably like the footprint of these tables, <laughs> I think. Um, so we, we don't have any other nooks. So this is, so basically anything that comes in above 204 is just going to class size. Yep. But we are we are we are confident with the NESDEC projections based on what what happened last summer. We feel <coughs> that with that many classrooms, there's room to spread spread people around. Lauren also works to not necessarily have every class the same size right. based on the needs of students, um, and so there might be some classrooms that are necessarily kept at that base 20. Um, we would love to see 18, as you know, right. and that's what we're planning for. Um, in the new building, right. but we also know, and, and Lauren is, is, is a wonderful cheerleader for her staff in terms of um, really providing them with the support that they need. One of the things um, that she's really talked about is given class size, we really need kindergarten teachers to all have access to a paraprofessional um, because of <coughs> there's a lot of little bodies to manage. So, um, yeah, there's... The and even now when we have students that is. are registering, it, it, we, I also look at what, what class, our classrooms are not um, equal in size. So we do have one first grade class that has more than any other, but she also has one of the largest classrooms. And teachers are understanding of that, of why um, that teacher has more than, than her neighbor, and um, she is doing a fabulous job with, with those students. No, I mean, as always, yes. the level of flexibility and creativity that you and the staff show in that building to continue to deliver such a great education is, is commendable, and mm -hmm. uh, hopefully they all feel like there's something so much better on the horizon in a few years. So it is exciting. From a facility perspective. So, um, but no, that was, I mean, other than that, I think from my perspective, all of the, uh, I mean, all of the, the additions, it seems a relatively straightforward budget. So I'm good. A question about the piloted program. So, will that yeah. be some? Was that piloted in all classrooms, or have some teachers never had any exposure to that, and that would be anything that would require professional development? Or we will require um, professional development. We currently have okay. four classrooms piloting um, the program: two at kindergarten, two at first grade. To begin the pilot, they visited some area schools that were implementing the program. Um, this year, they've even uh, we've had some observe the other teachers and we've invited other teachers not yet implementing the program that are hearing great things about it as we check in with progress monitoring how is it going and offering those visits to learn more about it um, so teachers are really looking forward we also if approved we also will have the materials in the hands of teachers in June so that oh, they can start going eyes. through we have planned and budgeted for professional development to take place in the summer um, and part of that planning means that teachers are paid to come to attend that. Um, that's all part of the plan so that we can implement a strong beginning to the year. The, I, I am familiar with this program and uh, it does require um, a high level of professional development initially if it's going to be, if it's going to be used appropriately. Um, so we know that it's really important when we put new materials in teachers' hands to make sure that they feel adequately prepared to use it. Um, and so that's all part of the um, budget. So that's already plan. accounted Already for. in there. Great, thank and you. It's in the uh, last time we were together, we uh, had the central office, which included professional mm -hmm. development. And in there are two sources mm -hmm. of funds. One is center school PD. It's partly in there. Okay. The other place it's in is the uh, district-wide PD. That's a larger sum of money, and it's in there. 
Kathy and I, in order to make sure that, because uh, we looked at reductions in that uh, cost center as well, mm -hmm. Kathy and I came up with a very specific professional development plan for next year, identified how much each of these uh, different initiatives we need to earmark for uh, professional development to support it so it would be successful. We made sure before we reduced anything that that would be covered in those funding sources. Okay. So something great that will also support next year is we will have these four teachers who have had a year under their belt teaching. They attended training um, prior to the start of this school year. That will be a resource um, to their grade level colleagues. Okay. Thank you. Um, so I also was going to just comment on the literacy program. One, because I have firsthand experience with it because my son's classroom is piloting it. Um, I, I think it's fantastic personally. but. Um, my question is based on, and you might not know the answer to this, Lauren, it might be a Bob question, but um, so it's K and 1 for center school, but how does it align with the ELA program at Elmwood? Well, that'll be an Ann question. <laughs> <laughs> Bob question. Sure. Yeah. Um, it has a bigger footprint in grade 2, and then by grade 3, it's going to be targeted for students that need this specific support to uh, get up to grade level. So it's not something that's all encompassing in grade three. And I'm sure when Ann Carver comes up here, she can add more details about how it's going to lay out in Elmwood. But that's a good question, Jeff, Lori. So there is going to be transition with the program. OK, yeah. so it, it, it blends yes. itself up through this school. It um, OK, and I guess, well, I mean, that's not really a question for the budget, but I'm assuming that if this does go through in this year's budget, that will there be um, introduction for the parents that are going to be using this new program? Or oh, yes, I think that would be helpful for them to understand the language that their children might be using um, and why um, certain things are taught in a way, because it would be very different from how you perhaps learned when um, parents were at that age. Certainly an overview parents that aren't able to attend, we typically put the presentation on the website um, so that they, they're able to refer back to it. I didn't have any other questions. Do you want to go Sure. Um, I don't, I, most of my questions got asked. I do want to um, just comment that, again, I, I'm seeing the consistency of, you know, as Kathy was saying earlier, um, the focus on prevention, so with the co-teaching, with the full day pay, with the investment up front in these kinds of resources and steps, <coughs> A, because it's a better model for the children, the most importantly, but the side benefit is that down the road you save money. I don't know if anybody to my left is listening to me. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so I just want to make sure that we made that point, but um, so I think that that um, so that's just consistent with what we have been doing for the last several years, really, um, since Dr. McLeod got here. And I, it, it is probably an unfair question, so you can tell me. You'll tell me next year. But is there a little bit of a preview about what might be coming down the road that we should be expecting? Or do you feel like with the addition of this staff, this is pretty much you're, you're set up now for a couple of years, or you're where you want to be? Um, I think, I oh, that? yes, go right ahead. I mean, I think it's, that, that's a tough question to answer. Um, what I will say is that what I've noticed from the time that I've been here is our population is changing. Mm -hmm. And um, by that I mean uh, I feel we're getting a more diverse population, which means we're getting more diverse student needs. Mm -hmm. So I think it would be a little um, early to answer, to say, yeah, we're all set for a few years. We don't quite know what we're getting in terms of students coming in. And so I think we need to be a little careful right now with with that. Maybe a few years ago where we didn't quite see the population <coughs> changing like it is now, it might have been uh, a different uh, forecasting environment. But for right now, I think we need to have a little caution there. OK. I mean, I'm basically, yeah. I think what it boils down to is they're not, there's not a big programmatic change that's sort of looming the way that we've put in the full day K. We're, you know, adding in the, the co-teaching, <coughs> and, and we'll see that we're expanding that a little bit as we go through the different schools. That was really more my question, not specific to more of a larger program change. Now you're putting in the new literacy materials for this better program, and um, that was really more. We, my we will be talking to you in next year's budget about science. Okay. 
So that's definitely kind of <laughs> at the elementary level. And we will be having further discussion next week about how that relates to the conversation about world languages expansion. So that's very related and very mindful in terms of minutes of numbers of minutes of instruction that kids have at the K three level. Um, and the fact that teachers are teaching all content areas. So what you can expect is to have a very detailed conversation in FY18 about elementary science instruction. Okay, thank you. That's exactly okay. right. You're welcome. You're all set? Yep, thank you. Um, so I have a few questions. One is, are these prioritized, one, two, and three? Or no, it's not set up that way at all. So, so are you saying that the literacy coach is a priority over the intensive specialist? is a priority. <coughs> it's hard for me to put any of these three above another. Okay. Um, it really is. What remains in the budget discussions that, so that's, there were priorities in the first go round before the re additional reductions. What you see in front of you are, are, that you'll be hearing from the principals, are absolute needs that we all agree um, are priorities for the buildings in order to meet the programmatic needs. Um, and, or they wouldn't still be in here. They would have already, if it wasn't a priority, it would have been taken out. So I would say that the answer to that is no. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And then I think it was Ralph said that the BCBA is in the special ed mm -hmm. budget. So can you just, I'm sure you can sure. tell me really easily where it is. Under the sped budget. It would be in a line called behavioral specialist. So I see sped behavioral services. Yep. That's, that's where it. it would be. Yep. So that's just the. $13,000 increase over oh, what we had. That's not it. That's why I don't think that's it. Okay. Well, Sorry. We'll look under personnel. Give, give Ralph a minute. Yep. Yeah. I, I think he has a memory. <coughs> <laughs> I just need to find SPED. Um, four four line. <laughs> oh, I gave my uh, SPED budget oh. away tonight. Sorry. Would you like it back? No. <laughs> sure. Here it is. Teaching <laughs> staff <laughs> intensive. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. That's why I couldn't find it. Sorry, I can look out with it. If you were to look at Form 3, which is the last page of the uh, budget for SPED, the fourth line down. I'll say Form 1. Hold on. Oh, no, no, I got it. Hold on. I'm getting there. I'm there. I'm there. Okay. The fourth line down is a, is a 1.0 BCBA at the center school, 61665 And when you say oh, this person. I'm here for center. When you say this person sits at center, where they, we talked about lack of, lack of space, where are they actually <coughs> It's not Do someone who sits at a desk. Sitting? They'll have a landing spot. Okay. So ideally, this is someone who, <laughs> who is in classrooms, working with students, working with teachers. Um, okay. Yes. So they do not require a room. And are they limited um, in age? You mean of who they would support? Um, in what their certification is, I don't. Right? Oh, I don't. I don't Great believe question. so. Um, so there, there's different certifications, and you know what? Yeah. We will. We will. We will. Yeah. Re we're going to reach out and call a friend right now. So, Dr. Zaleski, yeah. can you stand up and answer that question, please, <coughs> about BCBAs and certification and age? Sure. Thank you. So, board certified behavior analysts are um, certified to serve all age range, so much like school adjustment councils and guidance councils. Certainly, guidance. Um, it's a little different breed. They can serve as K to five and five to eight. But board certified behavior analysts serve district wide, which essentially when we hire them, we can appoint them to buildings or we can appoint them to system wide, mm -hmm. um, depending on where the service delivery needs lie. Um, and to Lauren's point, they are not stations uh, specifically at a desk servicing any particular age range. Um, <coughs> in this instance, they would be servicing at that building level because that's where we would appoint them specifically. So if there is a need, um, there's less of a need at center in, let's say, 2018 or, yeah, 2017, like the following year. We can, they presumably mm -hmm. could help a child that moved into Elmwood that was still having issues or mm -hmm. we needed them at Elmwood. Certainly. For, for okay. instance, right now we have a board certified behavior analyst that's servicing across three grade levels. Okay. That relates to one of my requests. <coughs> okay. Thank you, Karen. Thank you. Thank you. And for children, when we look at the whole child, if the social emotional area is not regulated, it's hard to learn. Mm. So that's the significance of that um, position is to help 
address and support that area of development and it's just that the BCBAs have the skill set and the tools to be able to support and promote positive behavior so that once we are able to regulate and support that then we can focus on learning. And does this reduce need for guidance services, or no, not really? It's a whole different population. It's, it's like if you, it's a specialist. Like if you're, you have a primary doctor, and then you have specialists. So the guidance counselors are primary. We work with a variety uh, of needs, any needs, separation, transition, transitions, family needs, friendship challenges. This would be the next layer up. So if you're thinking of tiers as response to intervention, this would be tier two and tier three. For the children that still might work with our guidance counselor, um, in those small groups, sharing, taking turns, um, how to be a good friend, but yet cannot transition that to a classroom and have a hard time um, sort of complying with what we should do in a classroom. So do we think that it will reduce the load on our current guidance counselors? Or? I hope so. That, that would, I mean, as fabulous as our guidance counselor is, she is, um, I think her latest case load had 40 students. That's a lot okay. um, because we do a lot of check-ins. Um, and it ranges from I'm moving to a new house and somebody didn't want to play with me at recess. I mean, it's, it's wonderful, but I think it would greatly assist um, her workload. And I would see them working together so that guidance, the classroom teacher, and the BCBA work together to sort of triangulate and like hone in on that. So it's not separate approaches to meet a child, but a unified approach, which should then help us uh, move through that in a uh, so another difference manner. is that the guidance counselor also does classroom instruction, so I don't know if you've been hearing any superflex language in your homes. Um, but Blurred out blue, you know, um, any of those. The, no, that's no, what no, 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 no. it's called. Oh, you, you're, you're identifying with this, Mr. Graziano. Yeah. You're this is a about, dinner table oh, you know, about, about, about I could run through some of them <laughs> for okay, you. Okay, I thought you were Some of which she apparently models. <laughs> Okay. We're working on it. There you are. So, so she will go in and be teaching lessons to kids, coping skills class wide, versus the BCBA is more individualized in terms of um, her her needs there. Um, you done? I have one more question. No, I do too. Go ahead. Okay. Mine's about ELA. I don't have any more questions about the BCBA. Um, with the ELA and um, the literacy coach, and already an increased possible need for PD because we, we are going to have a new curriculum. I mean, is this, and I'm sure you've thought about it, but I'm just asking it out loud to get the answer. Is this really the right time to have a literacy coach come in? Because, right, they're already <coughs> going to be faced with PD on a new curriculum, and so do we also really have a need for a literacy coach this year? Can I, may I? Please. You can go yes. first. Yes. May I? <laughs> so, it's clearly a softball. It's, she wants to know. it's a great, great question because it yeah. gives us the opportunity to talk a little bit more about what the difference is between a literacy coach and a reading teacher. Um, the idea that when we, and this is our philosophy and it's something we've been talking about a lot, is that when a student leaves your classroom and goes down the hall to a specialist for some specialized instruction and then comes back to you, there's no, there, it's very difficult to have opportunities for interaction so that you, the classroom teacher, knows what was going on down the hall. So the idea of a literacy coach is that they come in, work with identified groups of students within a classroom teacher's classroom, still providing expertise around the reading area, but then models the instruction in the classroom and at the same time in, you know, addressing kids' needs as well as assisting teachers in broadening their toolbox. And so it kind of meets both things. It's not that um, Lauren doesn't already have that level of support for kids who are struggling with reading, but it takes it a little bit deeper and, again, is consistent with the preventative model because now we're increasing skill set. So but it, it is the absolute right time for it because of all the things that are going on with a new program because it can be just like the comparison is our integration, our technology integration specialists. It, it's the perfect comparison to that. It's there's new technology in your classroom. Let me come in and model how to use it. And it would support the phonemic awareness of the program, so it, don't think of it as two separate things. So here's a program. This is my area of expertise. I can even help you yep. implement and um, look at growth and how do you determine if it's enough growth because you might need to do more of X or more of Y. So mm -hmm. it would help support that. It wouldn't be conflicting. 
May I ask? Yes. You? So I did <coughs> ask all of the elementary principals to come prepared to talk about co-teaching and some successes that they've experienced. Um, and so before we lose Lauren, um, I wanted to just pitch that question to her in terms of, <coughs> Lauren, I know you've been really creative in your co-teaching approach and that you've had, um, you particularly had a classroom that had a co-taught reading specialist with a gen ed teacher. I just wonder generally if you can give us some feedback <coughs> on some trends that you've seen. Yes, sorry. Um, <laughs> I can't speak. I no, know. I can't. I'm getting better. So, Would you rather? No, I'm, okay. I'm good. So <laughs> last year we had um, a reading co-taught classroom in special education at K and 1. Looking at our student population and our needs, that shifted to first grade because the students moving up and many of them were students that came to us with identified needs was greater. So instead of keeping a model and having students fit, Fix, fit to that model, we shifted the co-teaching. We have four co-taught classes at first grade this year, two reading co-taught classes, two special education co-taught classes. At the beginning of the year, we collected our benchmark data. I met with teachers. We looked at um, overall spreadsheets. How is your class performing? It's color-coded. The colors for the reading co-taught classes was not very colorful, and it looked very different than other classrooms. These teachers, they were ready for the challenge. They were excited for it. They see it as a little competitive because they want to change all the colors on their um, mm -hmm. grid, which for the first grade co-taught class that is in their second year of this model, they did that last year, and they're ready for that challenge again. These teachers regroup, assess. The, at times, they have 11 different l groups in their classroom. They work with students twice, three times a day. Some of the groups com are comprised of one child because that child is at a level that needs that intense focus and I checked in with that um, those teachers last week and they've already moved these levels up there see that validates all the effort going in in the work because it's a lot of work to plan and adjust to make sure you have the appropriate materials that you're stretching them reinforcing um, reading that they can do to build fluency it is validated when you have the results and you see the progress so already in December as teachers are sharing their progress monitoring data it, 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 it spurs them on because I'm gonna say it's exhausting I know I feel like a taskmaster sometimes but this is in as much as I say you're doing a great job you've got it when they see the results when they're checking in that's when it just validates it to them so I know when teachers met with parents at parent conferences they were able to even share look at the growth your child has made already um, and it was Im impressive for them, and it, it has been very positive. So we'll get, like we did last year, we'll get you another report, but um, you know, written report. But I felt that the question came, I think, from Eugene, that yeah, really you know, helpful. because this is relevant for this budget process, and it, it's only December, um, to have some sense of, of the efficacy um, of, of this improvement. Um, I just wanted to bring that to the table. Yeah, so, right. yeah. um, thank you. Yeah. No, it is getting better. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I used my oh. Oh. Yeah. Oh. Rob. Bob. Yeah. I did too, but it'll be okay. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Now I'm gonna let you on. Thank you. Mrs. Carver. Hi. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. Hi. Mr. Hello. Hunt, Mrs. Carver is the interim principal at the Elmwood School. And uh, nice to meet Mr. you. Mr. Her is on the Board of Selectmen. He is the liaison to the Board of Selectmen to the school committee, and so that's why he's, he's here tonight. Um, and thank you for being here, and I'll turn it over to you. Sure. So um, I'm going to start with our budget overview. Um, Elmwood is anticipating, based on NASDAQ prediction, predictions, to have a 21 student increase in grade two and a 17 student decrease in grade three. This, uh, this, these numbers will um, give us an average of 20.9 students in grade two if we increase our, our classroom teachers by one in grade two. And in the third grade classroom, we would have 11, in third grade, we would have 11 grade three classrooms, uh, which is not a change, and we would have an average of 21.9 students per class in grade three. Um, How many did you have in move in last summer? Just um, oh, I don't know. okay. I'm sorry to throw that at you, but but we I had a significant say there were 24. Number. Yeah, is what I'm recollecting. Um, and so part of this, I want to remind the school committee, is that we need to plan for move-ins in the summer, and we feel right. that that class size 
in second grade without the additional section, the numbers would just be too high. Um, starting at 20 and understanding that we have, we feel comfortable that we could add another mm -hmm. two, three students to each of those classrooms, not only over the summer but throughout the year. Um, that 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 that's a a, a good and we're to adding get, students to begin now. At. I mean we're still correct. Um, it just doesn't enrolling stop. new mm -hmm. students. So twenty point nine. Twenty one. It is twenty one. Yep, yep, I would think so. Mm -hmm. um, and so our budget is aligned with our school improvement plan and it meets the, with the strategic plan as well. Uh, if you look down at the personnel summary, one of the first things that um, I'm requesting is to add a point five learning specialist. We currently have five point five. And I'd like to increase that to six. In doing so, give it is my hope to add two additional co-taught classrooms next year. Um, we are, currently have one in each grade level, so one in grade two and one in grade three. I'd like to add one to each grade level. Um, and this will provide support for a wide range of students across the buildings. Um, having an, an additional learning specialist, or point five of one, um, increase flexibility with inclusion, uh, improve education, and student educator and student ratios. Um, the second thing that on my um, personnel summary that I'd like to address is, and Lauren already did a beautiful job of, uh, of saying that we'd like a shared um, literacy coach. I don't know how I can um, add much to that, but really what's important, Lauren and I have really been fortunate this fall to spend a lot of time together. We would really like to create some consistency from Elmwood, from Center School to Elmwood School it's important um, to us to, that we do that. So we're requesting someone that would be shared, and then in that way we would know that the things that are started in center school are not lost someplace between you know, the buildings. And uh, it, it would be ongoing professional development that, as Lauren has said, the, um, a, learn, a, a reading coach would be working with students, would be working with staff, and it would be, it would be system-wide, so that's important to us. Um, the next personnel request that I've made is to increase our <coughs> administrative assistant from a point six to a point eight. Uh, there is really, we have, have all kinds of things happening in our front office and, and the people that are in the office are the first face that folks see when they come into Elmwood School. I would love to be able to provide additional staffing to support st safety when students arrive and leave school. Um, I'd also like to improve communication at Elmwood School and having an additional person there would help me do that. Um, and it, it would also address the additional requirements made of us with our four new classrooms of pre-K students that are, are in the building and, and happy to be there. Um, the next thing on my, on my list is the expense summary which also includes additional funding to implement the, um, a research-based literacy uh, enhancement which will address spelling, reading, handwriting, and, and <coughs> does align with the Common Core. And it's it's, this, it's the same pro program that Lauren is implementing or would like to implement. We have two classes currently piloting the program. It would be something specific to grade two. Uh, it, it might be used in grade three as a, a support or remediation, but it would specifically address the needs of grade two um, students. And that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Anne. You're welcome. Could I point out a clerical mistake on my behalf? <laughs> uh, on Form 3 for the Elmwood School, uh, where it says literacy coach, under reason for request, in your book it's going to say no longer needed. Right. It's a weird reason to add. Yeah. What it ought to say <laughs> is exactly what it said in the center school, which is improve instruction and adjustment to practice, share with center. I think there's two different forms that I've seen now. Yeah. So we will fix that. <clears throat> I won't make Ryan go first. Does anyone want to go first in the school committee? I can go first. All right. Um, so I know that there, so I know you're talking about increasing the number of COTA classrooms, but which is great, but I also know that there are other types of classrooms within Elmwood currently this year, such as the looping classrooms. Um, I'm not aware, are there any job share classrooms at Elmwood this We do year? have one. So are those classroom types anticipated to remain next year as well? I, I don't have, I have not anticipated changing <coughs> them. Okay. 
I think so. I should have asked Lauren this question before we let her go. <laughs> She's <but> still here. <laughs> but do we have those types of classrooms in center as well? Job share and looping? We or? have job share. We have one job share. And so you have one. We have one job share, and I would anticipate that continuing. And Tim has one, but not a looping, correct? With the job share classrooms, uh, what type of feedback do you get from parents on those classrooms? Really positive. Okay. The, the, we, it, the, the teachers themselves, one of the things for the, the two folks who are in those classrooms, they both have young families. I, I think that they were sort of struggling with, you know, putting their all into being at school when they know they have little families at home. And one of the things that we've noticed is that they're there consistently. So they're working there two days or there three days, and, and that there's really no need for a sub in those classrooms. The teachers have been very consistently present. Um, I've noticed that each teacher enhances the other with the wonderful things. You know, they really have a nice opportunity to share. They live, um, I think they live relatively close to one another, and they spend a great deal of time planning. Um, and the feedback from the teachers themselves is just a renewed energy for their work and knowing that they can put all that they can into it um, and still meet the needs of a little a young family. And I have not personally had any negative feedback from any family. Uh, one of the things we talked about at the end of last year was that we also had no students from that classroom last year that had any behavioral concerns at all. And of course, last year being new, we really weren't sure what um, it, it might look like. And, and I think it was a wonderful success. So the COTOT, assuming that the budget is approved for the additional COTOT classrooms in each grade level, would replace a, a regular classroom for next year. If that's the anticipated. Mm -hmm. okay. And if we could, if we could get an additional second grade um, teacher to meet the needs of the numbers, it, it could be that we decide to go in that route. You know, put it there. But yeah. The other thing, <coughs> um, the other reason, or the other thing we're trying to do, and and I know that Dr. Zaleski will address this as well is provide more consistency across the elementary buildings. Um, and so in meeting with the elementary principals, it became very clear that there were many more co-taught classrooms, for example, at the Hopkins School than there were at the Elmwood School. Um, and being a new principal with a new set of eyes on the way the program was running and the numbers of students that were being serviced in a pullout or resource room capacity, which is sometimes referred to as inclusion, it has so many different names, and seen the successes of co-teaching um, and really wanted to address that and, and have more comparability between the two buildings in terms of service provision. Um, so that's the other reason that you're, that you're looking at doing if that. If you'd like me to address my, I did come armed with some information about co-teaching. And so I, of course, I've spent some time in <laughs> with the co-teaching, uh, with the teachers themselves. And, and I asked the, the co-teachers, what do you love most about it? First of all, the, the numbers show that the students are making wonderful progress. Uh, aside from that, the teachers are thrilled about having the enhanced collabor collaboration between um, classroom teacher and learning specialist. Um, when you ask a co-teaching team, what do you like about it? I think in the very beginning, it was like a young couple. They struggled a little with <laughs> between being really polite to one another and uh, not really saying that, you know, what really bothers me is when you take my pen or something small. In the beginning, it was little things that they were afraid to speak about. But once they got through that and really learned to a, a nice working relationship, if you ask them what they love about the co-teaching model, they just beam. They love that they there's another person in the room to bounce ideas off of immediately. Especially with little children, somebody can do something, and if there's another adult in the room, I'm sure you know this of your, of your own families, if there's an, another adult, you smile and say, isn't that sweet? If you were alone, you might feel like, ooh, I, I don't know how to handle that. They sort of share the load of students. Um, the the teacher-student ratio is 1 to 12. Um, lots of frequent small group activities. The, one of the grade 3 learning specialists shared with me that six out of eight students on IEPs from her classroom last <laughs> year made a year or a, more than a year's growth in last year's school um, year. So that is, of course, what we're asking the high needs kids to do is to make, they really, in order to catch up, need to make more than a year's growth in a year's time. And, and six out of eight students in her classroom last year um, were able to do that. But more importantly, uh, the, the question was asked this week in classrooms, what do the kids like most about it? And so what each of the third, what each co-taught classroom um, 
gave me to share today is letters from the notes from the kids that say what they like about it um, and they're really wonderful but I'll share some highlights with you uh, one thing I love about about it is I get to learn the lesson in two different ways or words I like having two teachers because when we take a test and some people have ch a challenge or challenging words we can split up into two groups I like having two teachers in this class because it would take a long time for one teacher to answer a lot of questions then everybody's hand gets tired and that's bad <laughs> that's why I like two teachers you don't have to listen to the same voice all day uh, when I have two teachers it basically makes everything easier I like how it's going because I always have two teachers by my side oh, and that's wow. from the mouths of babes yep. so Excellent. So the only um, additional comment I'll make, so I I also have the experience of the co taught class oh, this year <laughs> and and have wonderful things to say about it myself, but in, not in relation to the budget, but just in relation next year to communicating with parents, and I would say this across all elementary schools, is that the general public of parents do not know all the different types of classrooms that exist. And when, even if they are named on their notification, mm -hmm. that doesn't necessarily provide a description to them. And I don't even know that that's in the handbook. So there's a lot of confusion among the public over what these types of classrooms are and what the benefits or mm -hmm. potential negatives or the perceived negatives mm -hmm. are. And so I found at the yep. beginning of the school year answering a lot of questions on the soccer field as to what the myths were about these types of classrooms. Mm -hmm. and also actually not feeling prepared as to how many of those classrooms exist okay. so that would just be a recommendation I would make in terms of communication for next year because I think there is a, a lack of information and then the filler that gets put in there is generally negative and I, I think that hurts the programs overall okay so the differentiation between co-taught between looping and between <coughs> and um, I think when co-teaching was first established people had more cons I think as they experience it it seems as if the, the concerns, at least from what I'm hearing, have lessened. Mm -hmm. But I do know the first year we had co-teaching in particular, there were a lot of questions. Yeah, and I think for parents that their oldest child is the first one to experience yep. one of these classrooms, it becomes mm -hmm. like a... I agree. We'll, I we'll make sure. Sorry. Yep, very, very helpful. Kind of a math question. So how do you, how do you get two new co-taught classrooms out of an increase of ah. 0.5 people? Point five would be the well we we would already have the person so okay. we we have 5.5 5 and, and adding point 0.5 is just having somebody there full-time versus yeah, she's changing time. service delivery so but you're adding your two classes oh, no she's changing she's reassigning okay, can you explain this this I'm not uh, sure how but these would be made up of existing yeah. personnel yeah. and the point oh, five I'm increase. Not sure. So now we're getting a little bit too yeah. specific in terms of teacher assignment in a public. No, meeting. I just I just wondered if you're going to double from yep. two. So do you need Kelly, more personnel, no. or it's within there are people existing who are personnel. currently in different. Um, you know how I talked okay. about co-teaching, resource room, inclusion, a variety, a continuum of services in special education, but provided provided in her building by 5.5 people currently. Okay. So what she's seeking to do is increase the numbers of co-taught. Okay. Um, by by doing looking at potentially reassigning people from where they're what they're currently doing. Okay, I think it was just confusing saying I want to increase five point five to six sure. in order to I know double. I get it. Yeah, okay. it does. So it's it not feels like it's the really one two. person who stretched across. No. It's oh, no. a, a reassignment no. of correct responsibility. Yeah, great, great pickup. Okay, and yep. I know I'm probably stealing John's question, but um, there is an extra classroom for the additional uh -huh. second grade. Yes, there is. Mm -hmm. All right. I only asked that question about center school. <laughs> oh. <laughs> okay. Well, then I didn't steal it. I'm done. Thanks. Um, so my only remaining questions are actually around the um, the administrative assistant additional expense. Okay. So I'm just noting, and I'm, I'm glad we have these year-to-year -year budget summaries because I was testing my memory. We went up in this line item last year, too. And we also went up by a significant amount in element in extra clerical hours. So I assume sort of additional temp type work and we're going up again but we're not seeking to reduce those additional hours okay so I think that's a good point mm -hmm. I think it's a good point it's one that we discussed at, at one of the other schools yep. but not at this one okay so, so yes. we, we need to look at that okay look at that and then so 
so that was one part of it. But then also from the standpoint of the, uh, so we talk about improving communication, additional personnel to support school safety. So is this largely driven by the, the changes in arrival dismissal? Uh, sort of what's, okay. So that's, I was looking for what is the big change yeah. that we didn't get yeah. it right last year that we need to move mm -hmm. up. Okay. This position currently works on the average 6.4 hours a day. Yep. And a point eight in our language is full-time school year. So it should go to eight uh, right. hours a day for 198 days, including uh, holidays. Okay. And no, she's the person's already, it's already a point six, mm -hmm. so it's not right. a benefit shift. Right. So, okay. All right, then I'm all done. Thank you. I actually have the classroom question because I, given that you also have the preschool, I'm just, will you have any empty classrooms next year or you're at capacity? Meaning af if we were to assign a teacher if to one of those the, classrooms, would we have? to add the second grade. With the 12, 11, and the preschool, do you, does we that We have a any? lot of office spaces slash classroom areas in the back of the school that could potentially be used as learning spaces. Because um, if I remember correctly, this year the you had so many move-ins in the summer that your class size is really higher than you had wanted, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. So I just was concerned if we had that same experience mm -hmm. again. Do you have? Any? So there are spaces, as Anne has described, but um, in addition, spaces that are currently divided with with dividers for more small group instruction or for example, pull out services that we're trying to provide more in classrooms that could be made back into one space. Um, I believe there are two of those. Well, we did one of those for this school okay. year. Yep. So you would um, have flexibility if you needed it, but it's not ideal yeah. because yep. you're, right. you've, you, you're using all of the regular classroom yes, space that's at right. this point. That's, yep. That was really my question. Okay. And, um, you know, I, again, I think the rest of my questions were answered and just to comment uh, again that it's just very consistent with what you've been trying to do, um, again, Kathy, since you came, which is before we're adding more, what, are, what can we take away or redistribute or reassess how, how we're using. Mm -hmm. So I just, I like the constant reevaluation of what our current practice is before we pile onto it or, mm -hmm. um, you know. Mm -hmm. So that's yeah. just an observation, so thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Um, I have a quick question about COTOT, and it might, you know, we can't answer it today, but something to think about. Okay. Um, with respect to tracking, so I know you said six out of eight kids in the COTOT, and I assume this is from last year, um, six out of eight moved off their IEPs. What's they weren't necessarily moved off of their, their IEPs, but okay. they, okay. they grew. Met their goals. Yeah. Yep. And how does that relate to a single teacher classroom? Hmm. Good comparison. So we'll have to do some research on that and provide provide a um, more detailed report. And then, I guess my other question is, and I did always, I remember that Hopkins last year we added more COTOT, so that's why I we think did. they they have mm -hmm. more than Elmwood. But are we finding that students in who had COTOT in first grade or had COTOT in second grade were also um, and they're they're the IEP students, they're also getting the COTOT the following year, are we moving them? It, it, it varies, it varies, um, and you know, I think, I think Tim will be a really good person to speak to this because he's had so much experience with it. Mm -hmm. He's also got some really nice data that I'm going to hand out, um, but the reason I say that is because we look at um, different profiles of students who are going to do well in that type of environment. Um, and so it could be that some kids who are on IEPs get it sequential years, and it could be that they may not based on the, their changing needs. Um, but based on their changing needs, based on their progress or lack thereof. So those decisions are made on an individual basis, but it would be very interesting to compare the rate of progress of students, so student growth percentile, versus on students who have been in a co-taught environment for multiple years. Um, given that this is the first half of our second year, we wouldn't have that data until, you know, later on in the year, but I think it, it's something we should really, is worth tracking. Um, and I guess maybe my concern, and, and maybe it's not valid, but it mm -hmm. would be that as we increase co-taught in the elementary years or at that center and at Elmwood, are we going to therefore increase the need at Hopkins? Because we've actually set up a system now where 
population of students are used to a 12 to 1 no. ratio and they're not going to get that <laughs> those, are, those are such great questions. And so the, the, the goal over time is to use a preventative model to eventually reduce the numbers of needs of COTOT or any kind of special education needs over time. We know that it's not going to be none, but we do know that if we develop a good model that catches kids early, the demand at the lower levels will be less and eventually when we catch up and we do more than a year's growth in a year, the gap is going to close it's, and eventually we'll need fewer, we'll be servicing fewer special education students over time. It will take five years to get there. Um, the progress that we're al already showing that, that Tim is going to hand out to you tonight is very, very exciting. Um, but we got to fill the gap, so we got to work for both ends. We have to work from the kindergarten preventative piece, and we also have to meet the needs really well of kids where they are who didn't get that at the beginning. And so that's why more co-taught at, um, and other things Tim's going to talk to you about at that level um, to meet those kids' needs, and then, you know, really growing, pushing it forward so that over time those needs will reduce. It, it, it will not be that we're building a need for teachers to keep to have two teachers. What we're doing is we're, <coughs> we're really meeting their needs so that they don't have as great um, of a need. So you won't, you won't see that. Okay? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Welcome. Mr. Her, Mr. Manning. And can I welcome Mr. Manning? Thank you so much, first of all, for being here. Secondly, I apologize that this is the first time you're getting your hands on those documents um, because I understand that it was not, it was intended to be communicated to you, but it was not. So I'll we, I'll apologize for that, but thank you. I know you had another meeting tonight, and we're delighted that you could come. I'm glad I'm here. Thank you. Okay. He's a quick study. I don't know who <laughs> wants to wants so to start, but we welcome your questions. To the shared literacy position. Okay. Uh, how many other shared positions do we have in the district? Oh, quite a few. Well, yeah, yeah. Between schools. Mm -hmm. yeah. They yeah. travel. Um, I, again, Dr. Zaleski will, will be the best person when she comes up, but there's a lot of specialists, um, even actually even specialists like um, music, music art, and music, art across the district. Between Center and Elmwood, I guess, in particular, what I'm thinking. How many shared do you right have between your two buildings? a wellness sure, yeah. person. Wellness. We're sharing a BCBA. Yeah. Um, I, I think that's all, right? Uh, I am a speech person going to preschool, but... Oh. ELL. So. ELLs being uh, shared yeah. as well. So that's that's good language learning. So, you know, 15 years into this for me, uh, in town doing different roles within the community, you, you learn something every day, and this is great. That just like really lit up in my brain. Because if you think back a few years ago to that dreaded word of districting, and all the concern about the kids moving from one school yeah, yeah, yeah. to the next school to the next school, and the disruption every two years in their little lives, and, and, and some of the turmoil that may come from you know, with that for some of the kids anyway. The idea of sharing, and the mm -hmm. more we share, the more consistency they see from school mm -hmm. to school. I think uh, it's very it important. Makes great sense. And, mm -hmm. and I've never thought of it before until it came up tonight. So uh, I think it's a great idea and something the community should welcome and fund without question. So, and sharing not only in, in personnel, but also in resources, Brian, and thank you for that comment because the elementary principals are working very closely together. Not only you heard about this literacy program, but responsive classroom, social emotional program that we have that, that <coughs> they've been working really hard on making sure that they have consistent language for kids, consistent consequences, so that when I go from one building to the, nut, to the next, and I'm only going from first grade to second, I'm going to have the same expectations mm -hmm. placed on me around my behavior and the same kind of language around consequences that they don't have to learn it all over again. And, oh, okay, this, this feels like that same kind of place that I came from. Um, so curriculum materials, professional development, both uh, we're looking at some writing that was started at the K-1 building, is now in the 2-3 broke building, math. some math um, professional development that by the same provider, providing the same message, although developmentally appropriate. All of these ways provide that, uh, lessen the, the reaction to all of the transitions. Um, and so I'm glad you pointed up on that. Right. Yeah. We've, had, we had, yeah. we've had our first <coughs> shared faculty meeting between Center and Elmwood, which was really a big hit. The, the teachers were very happy to be in one space. They, they share students. We all share the same families. 
um, and it was nice for the teachers to be together. Mrs. DeBow has been working very closely with me <laughs> to help me make my way. That's great. Thank you. Do you have any questions? I know you haven't I had don't a chance. Have any okay. I'm just right Thank now. you. Okay. Thank you. Great. So, All right. Thank you I very think much. we're Thank ready you. for. Thank you. Um, nice job. Thank you. We're ready for Mr. Kernan. Tim, I am passing out the data, so that's what's being pushed, pulled around here, so that when you are ready to talk about it, um, the school committee and our, our guests have copies um, of that. And we will turn it over to you. Thank you for being here. Well, thank you for having me. I, I, I appreciate the opportunity to speak on uh, the Hopkins School and, and the work that we're doing at Hopkins this year and looking forward to next year. Certainly our, our, our proposed budget at Hopkins School supports um, several of the strategic uh, plan initiatives that, uh, that we've um, been working under for the last two years. Um, you know, many of these goals are, are goals that, um, that we, we started last year or this year and uh, we're, we want to continue with next year as far as de developing our curriculum to, to focus on, uh, on depth of understanding and uh, rigor um, over just basic knowing. Um, you know, communicating to all our kids that we have high expectations for, for, their, um, for their achievement and their growth, meeting those di diverse needs of our students um, by finding different methodologies, different materials, different instructional techniques. Uh, and certainly we want to share and proliferate those uh, successful practices among our teachers. So sharing best practices, sharing um, common experiences among our staff. Uh, one of the things that we've been focusing on this year is developing and improving our assessment techniques and utilizing that data that we're gleaning from those assessments to uh, to inform our teaching, um, to improve learning, uh, so that we're using uh, data-driven uh, decision-making, uh, evidence to support those instructional approaches and recommendations, yeah. and certainly, um, you know, making sure that we're connecting with families um, so that we have that effective homeschool mm -hmm. partnership, as well as supporting the social-emotional growth uh, of our students. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. As a classroom overview, next year um, we're projecting uh, 490 students at the Hopkins School, which is a decrease of 13 students from uh, October 1 uh, of this year. Uh, next year we're projecting to have 12 fourth grade classrooms and 10 fifth grade classrooms. So overall that's a decrease of one section. Uh, so we have 23 classrooms this year. Next year we're looking at 22. Our grade four class size projections will be at 22 students per class. And our grade five uh, projections would be at 22.6 uh, students per class section. Um, the only uh, personnel request that I'm, I'm looking for uh, next year is uh, the, um, adding an adjustment counselor to the Hopkins staff. Uh, we have a growing need uh, to address the social emotional health of our students at Hopkins School. That's based on um, some survey data that we have on our students um, that they, they completed this year as well as what we've seen over the last two, two to three years really is a growing number of teacher uh, referrals to our guidance counselor and parent referrals to our guidance counselor for support with social emotional health. Um, that, social, that adjustment counselor will be working with individuals and small groups uh, in counseling sessions. They'll be training uh, students in social skills uh, communication and coping strategies. Um, the Adjustment Council will be working on prevention. It's something that we talked about earlier, prevention and intervention uh, for our students that are do uh, that have an identified need of uh, for social emotional support. Um, assisting students with transitions, whether it's school to school transitions, grade to grade, or just those developmental milestones that uh, some of our students hit in fourth and fifth grade. Um, there's a lot of transitions happening for our kids. Uh, as well as you know, further strengthening that homeschool partnership and that school to community partnership, um, you know, contacting and, and being in touch with uh, with counselors outside of the school realm, so that students that are receiving those social emotional supports outside of school have that connection here at at, at, at Hopkins School as well, so that we're using um, common languages and having common understandings about how our kids are doing and growing. Uh, we know that just adding. A, an adjustment counselor is not the cure-all um, for our, all of our for all of our needs. We know that we need to adjust our practices as well, and we're continuing to work on what we're doing as educators to meet our, the needs of our students, um, strengthening the, the parent and home connections, and understanding the shared responsibilities that we have as a staff 
um, blurring some of those lines, knowing that you know the guidance counselor isn't the only person that can address social emotional health, that teachers can, the assistant principal can, the nurse can, uh, you know our, our secretaries can. Everybody can work together to support our students. Uh, it's not just this is your role and that's it. Um, as far as our expenses go, um, there is an increase from FY16 to FY17. Um, the biggest need for that increase is uh, basically what we've been doing for the last two years is emptying out the cupboards. Um, and we've been relying on a lot of existing inventory and supplies. Uh, where there is um, some money remaining in the budget, we've been pre-ordering uh, some of our supplies from year to year. Uh, that is is no longer available for FY17. We're kind of uh, we we've cleaned out the cupboard as much as we can. Um, we're also looking to add some intervention materials uh, that we found successful this year that we've started to to use. Um, we'd like to grow those materials um, and supplies. We're also looking to decrease some of our um, the need for some of our consumables. We know that technology has been a huge addition to, to, to Hopkins School and our students are able to use that technology um, in ways that they haven't been before. Uh, this year we have uh, a two to one a Chromebook initiative at, at Hopkins School. So essentially um, there is uh, two students for every one Chromebook. That has been a huge success um, for our students and, and our teachers. Um, and that's going to allow us to you know, order less paper, workbooks, um, journals, things like that. Uh, we also need to order uh, some uh, equipment <coughs> supplies and replacements. Uh, we have some staff chairs that are original to the building. And uh, when, stu when teachers sit down in them, it's the, the snow pops out, the, all the stuffing comes out. So there's some, there's some uh, staff chairs that are in rough shape, things like that, and teaching easels that have just been moved around from room to room and parts of the room uh, in small group sessions. So those things are falling apart. So there's a couple of uh, items that we would like to uh, restock our, our equipment with at Hopkins School. So that's, that's the overview. Thank you. You're welcome. Do you want him to do an overview of the data before we start questions as part of this report or? I think that's too budget. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah. okay, does anyone have any questions? Said a couple easy ones. The, um, the library para and the lunch monitor seem to have been removed from FY17. Is that being covered <coughs> by somebody else? Those responsibilities that you don't need those. The, the lunch monitors we we found that we were able to address with um, with our para professionals this year. We we did some we had some creative scheduling and that that we were able to 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 figure out um, how to. How to safely uh, supervise students at, at recess and, and lunch. And that's when those those par those the lunch monitor position was being used. But we were able to okay. figure out how to do that with some creative scheduling. And then the hop library para also seems to be out of the budget for FY17. Yeah, is that, that something that's not necessary anymore? Or? Uh, there's been a shift in in those responsibilities. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Um. So I have a question with respect to the supplies, and initially the question may be actually for Mr. Dumas more. As I was looking through the summaries and comparative numbers, all the elementary schools took a significant jump in FY16. Was that the like an accounting? The, yep. Is that copy. the copier? Supplies. Yeah, was that the copy release thing? No. Okay. Um, in oh. FY16, so, I had it. Uh, the school committee agreed to uh, a... Um, a collapse oh, right. of all the various <coughs> right all okay good items. yep I knew there was something and I was yeah. yep if you looked at uh, the, the subtotal for supplies and materials going back to FY 12 rather than just looking at general supplies it would give you an idea of what we've been spending okay FY 12 for example was 55 and then 56 and then 54 FY 15 was 68 FY 16 at the Hopkins School actually decreased yep. quite a bit because he was using up uh, his his inventory and uh, effectively we're getting back up to where historically he really needs to be. So thank you for the reminder. I knew there was an explanation for that consistency. So the which leads actually segues nicely into my second question, which is 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 that so you talked about how you've been using some existing supply and that's run out. So do we think that this 
this number this year is sort of our going to be our run Normal. rate for Hopkins going forward? Okay. That would, I mean, yeah, based on, I mean, I would ideally so, we would like to continue to el eliminate some of those consumables. Sure. So, but yeah, this. But, but this way. is yeah. But last year was sort of the blip because you had some stock, and then but this is more like the run rate. We clean things out. Okay. We're yeah. hoping in the long term that we're going to decrease the amount of paper that's used mm -hmm. in this district. Absolutely. I mean, right now we're paying as a base for our copiers for 9.5 million copies. We really need to cut that number down, given. You know, all of the, the uh, technology. proliferation of technology, we need to cut it down. And I would just say, you mentioned the, the Chromebook initiative in Hopkins. I, experience, I have some firsthand experience with that with a student in Hopkins. Mm -hmm. And it's the the collaborative aspect of it is just really impressive. My, my fifth grade is already working on collaborative projects that she can share with people on Google Docs and work on at, at night and share. Um, the other, I mean, she told me the number of times she tells me she has to submit her homework when she's done at night to the teacher. It, it's, it's, I mean, it's, it's, it's a way sort of yeah. we're catching up with <laughs> the, with the, with the education sort of catching up in that way. But it's, it's great to see, and it's great to see the, the, the facility they have developing with that already. So Google Apps for Education have been um, just revolutionary for how teachers uh, distribute and collect and provide feedback for students. It has been a really powerful tool. Um, you know, we were very you know, nervous knowing that we were gonna have this huge influx of technology at Hopkins School this year. And our teachers were nervous, like, are we going to be able to keep up with the kids? Mm -hmm. And our teachers have embraced that wholeheartedly um, in, in, in adapting their practices uh, to meet those needs. And they've been excited about how um, easy it has been to manage and track all the, the their assignments uh, through Google Classroom. Um, it's been it's been really exciting, and and you know Ralph mentioned the printing. You know the, we, we're, we're, there's a common saying why you know why print when we can share. And it's just, <laughs> so that's what we're doing. So we're doing more of it, as much as possible. So yeah, it's been great. Thanks, John. Um, so I wanted to ask you the same classroom question. I don't remember how many classrooms there are in Hopkins. Are you using a space right now that's not a classroom that you're gaining back for next year? No, or? no we actually have two classrooms this year, uh, classroom spaces that are unaffiliated with a homeroom class. Okay. That were uh, traditionally what we've been doing is having our wellness teachers travel to the classrooms to deliver help. This year we're able to use those two classrooms as health rooms. Great which has been great for the wellness teachers. Um, they've really appreciated having that their own space. Um, so this would actually free up another classroom. Oh, good. OK. Yeah. Um, and then my, my other question is just about the adjustment counselor and sort of apropos of our last conversation about resource sharing, um, consistency, and transition between buildings. Would that person be working with the adjustment counselors at the middle school and the high school? So yeah. again, same language and expectations Absolutely. and strategies. Absolutely. And yeah, our guidance counselors do a really great job of that um, between Elmwood, Hopkins, and um, in the middle school, particularly around the beginnings of the year and the ends of the year when we're getting ready for those transitions and when we're meeting our new friends uh, that are coming in. Um, so they do a lot of coordination there. Certainly would expect that this, the same scenario to happen with our adjustment counselors of uh, you know, communicating and making sure that uh, we're meeting those kids, their needs as soon as possible when they walk in the door so that it's not a new learning experience for our staff okay. um, and our students so that we're able to, to get going and hit the ground running with, with our students um, as soon as possible. Yeah. I mean, That's a great question and, and I think um, the reason it's so important is we're not just meeting the needs of the kids today, especially in terms of Hopkins, we're trying to set them up for success in where they're right. going. Right. So that's why that communication yeah. piece is so important. No, I think that I think that's critical. So, and I assumed the answer was yes, but I wanted to yeah. ask it on TV. But um, I mean, I, I guess I I wish that wasn't a need that we had, but I think it's an it's an important one to fill. So I appreciate that. I mean, I see that from the original requests to what we have in front of us, you took a pretty significant hit, and I appreciate that. That's something that you still prioritize because yeah. it seems really critical to um, to the success of the students and so we're seeing you know as I think we're seeing you know across the country not just at Hopkins school but right. the 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 level of levels of stress and anxiety 
are creeping further and further down um, the ages. And um, as the world speeds up and our expectations change and, and, and um, adjust over time, um, our, our nine to 11 year olds are starting to feel feel that need. And um, you know, like I said, a, you know, just putting a person, throwing a person at it, isn't the cure all. No. But it's a it's a help to have a trained professional there to to support their students, to support the students, as well as help the staff right. um, and training staff as to how we can meet student need. Um, you know, de-escalating students, uh, responding to students. Um, you know, just their their nonverbal, you know, body language, the signs of anxiety that we see, things like that. I think having a trained professional on sta on staff um, is going to help us. Well, and I think as parents, we all observe that behavior is uh, it's, I don't, mature isn't even the right word, but um, behavior is starting earlier than when we went to school, or even my kids are older than their kids. Um, so I think it probably is. I, I'm sure you're right that it's very typical um, across the country. And so anyway, I just wanted to compliment you. I think I know it was hard to prioritize to get down to where you are, and I think it's um, it sounds like it's a critical focus for you and for the staff, so I appreciate that. The only question I had was just because, can you just describe for me the difference between an adjustment counselor and a guidance counselor and what they do? Um, I, I think the adjustment counselor is is focused on some of the more um, significant um, social emotional needs, whereas that the guidance counselor, um, who is our guidance, counselor, um, Jane Shea, is, is just, I can't I can't say enough about. Um, she's addressing more of the um, the early stages of some of those social emotional needs, the friendship issues, um, managing anxiety, uh, perspective taking when it comes problem solving. Um, those are some of the things that she's addressing now. Uh, she's also managing, um, helping to coordinate our 504s um, and meeting student needs in those, in that case, in those cases, um, as well as, you know, getting into the classrooms to help students in the classroom. When the need is elevating a little bit more significantly, I think that's where the adjustment counselor would step in. And I think it's true, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but that she used to be able to teach in the classrooms much more than she is now, Jane Shea. Yeah. Um, so the model that we talked about at the center school with the guidance counselor being able to get into the classroom and the kinds of things that you talk about at the dinner table, Mr. Graziano, these are things that I know that Jane used to be able to get in to classrooms much more than she's able to now. Um, and that, again, goes back to the preventative piece of this, that we want guidance counselors to be able to go in and reinforce skills before it is like a social group that has to happen because kids are struggling. So is that true that yeah. she's had to reduce the amount of time just yeah. because of We've, demand? Yeah, we, we were having that as a whole class, uh, both fourth and fifth grade so. classes were meeting with Mrs. Shea yeah, and, and having so. whole class instruction on um, you know, coping strategies, uh, healthy communication, uh, you know, de-escalating, uh, managing anxiety, things like that. But her caseload <laughs> became so great um, that we weren't able to have those whole class sessions and she really needed to focus on individual sessions and, and small group sessions. She was meeting, by the end of last year, she was meeting with approximately 100 students in one-on-one -on -one or small group sessions. So um, that became pretty significant. Thank you. I don't have any questions. You guys have budget questions? Uh, I think so. Okay. <laughs> the, the social emotion, I brought the microphone closer because I want to be sure I'm heard by those that are watching. The social emotional uh, staffing position is a $61,000 increase, but then you're deleting $93,816 in your budget by when that classroom, when one classroom went away, correct? Mm -hmm. So you're taking a position out of the school and out of the budget, and you're adding back in a social emotional uh, mm -hmm. counselor position, mm -hmm. so you're, and a, a couple other minor adjustments. So your overall, not minor in terms of me, but minor in terms of dollars, your overall decrease is a $50,891 decrease. So we have a school administrator for everybody starts screaming and yelling in town about the budget, deducting 50981 bucks from the yep. budget. That's correct. Thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about the social emotional thing. I said I wouldn't talk about education, but I think this is huge. Mm -hmm. I never hear people in town talking about their kids 
academic performance in school in Hockington in terms of their grades, in terms of what they're learning, in terms of the quality of the teachers, in terms of all those things. Never hear it. I constantly hear information from parents about their concerns, about the social, emotional, and I would add a word to it, cultural mm -hmm. aspects of the schools. And I don't think that's unique to Hopkinton. I think that's all over America, to your point, a few minutes ago. So I fully support spending money in this area. And this is me saying this, I think we should spend some more. Because I think that's where the, the challenges in education are today. Uh, so well done in filling that position or getting that position going. Uh, and I'd encourage the system to look at more of that because I think we need more of it because that's the feedback I get in Hopkinton. It is not about the quality of the education you folks put on the table for, for the families of Hopkinton, but there is a lot of concern about what's going on culturally in the schools of Hopkinton. And I think this is a perfect position to address that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. But thank you for cutting your budget. I appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I will just say the process, and, and Jean, you did point it out when, when you were question is that originally um, there wasn't a reduction uh, I mean we, uh, he, uh, Tim took on the challenge to say this is my number one priority and when asked to, to come and tell us how he was going to fund it um, he found a way and so um, again it, it's being obviously recognized here by many people Tim um, that you feel so strongly and know your kids so well that you know that this is just a, a, a great need in your in your building um, but he did it in a way that is not compromising his program. I want to stress that too. Um, we would never ask it, our administrators to provide a budget that was not going to meet the needs of their kids or that they did not feel comfortable coming forward with. Um, and the and the net result is is a a, re a reduction to your budget. So um, there's been some very hard that, work that's taken place. Since we're complimenting ourselves, <coughs> I think that that's the strength of some of the changes that we've made to the budget process this year because I'm feeling like. Um, the work that that you all did before bringing this forward this year, which we sort of more did together last year, um, I, I just I feel like the recommendations are stronger because you are more intimately familiar with the kids impacted, with the staff impacted, and what the change in dollars means. And um, you know, obviously, we have the high level view, but I, I think. I really, the presentations I think this year have, not that they weren't good last year, they really were, but I just, I feel like we're a step ahead of where we were a absolutely last year. So I just wanted to compliment everybody that's in the room on Thank this. you, Jean. Thank you. And if I could just add to that, Jean, I think it's a compliment to Kathy because she put a pressure on all the class centers to, if you want this, what are you going to reduce it? So I think even in terms of what we presented last uh, time we were here, there was some difficult decisions that have been made in terms of, well, if we really need this, then this is what we're going to have to look at. So yeah, no, I, think I think you'll see that too. also with the, with the presentations next time we get together as well. There was that uh, pu push to, what are you going to look at existing if you want this new? So. Great. Thank you. Yep. Mr. Manning. Sure. I also uh, like the fact that it's a uh, pretty level budget for the the school, the Hopkins school. I do have one question. It might have been gone over last week when you did the technology budget that you're using the Google the Chromebooks yep. in Hopkins, and I take it's also in the middle school, yep. middle school too. Is that going to transition as they go to high school? Is there going to be a switch, or are they suddenly going to switch to Apple? And, and he isn't here, and he's going to be madly texting the answer. Um, he, he, he addressed the question. Oh, Bob is going to speak to it. Thank you. <coughs> We're, we're continuing to examine that. Um, I think what happens is um, it's not necessarily the platform, it's how uh, intensely I'm using that as a student. So I think that's the bigger thing. Um, so in terms of Chromebooks, I'm not sure if that would be the vehicle or not moving forward because we need something that's pretty robust to handle a variety of pretty powerful programs that we put on there, but we're constantly examining that. We're not tied to any one model or make. We're looking at what meets our learning needs for our students. What happens is the students move up from the middle school, they're moving from primarily this web-based sort of environment to this very heavy application that sits on the machine and needs a more powerful processor. Okay, I'm, I'm asking that question because I don't know how many years ago it was the year, four years ago, because my daughter was the first year of the one-to-one -one initiative, mm -hmm. where the question was, you have to go with the Macs, the Apples, because mm -hmm. they're probably the most expensive, and mm -hmm. it's a 
kind of leaning in the direction is this a way of possibly moving forward to yeah. go to a less expensive platform for the so at the time people. we didn't have the amount of choice that we have now so clearly right <coughs> technology improves more quickly than we can turn the page but um, we do also want a machine that will last students at the high school level for the entire time that they're there that we're not needing to replace and that they just the use is just at a higher level but as Bob said between now and the time that we make that decision we're constantly looking at what's out there and what the capabilities are currently the capabilities of the Chromebook are limited in terms of what the needs would be at the high school but that's currently um, and and we're just constantly watching um, to see how we can provide students with what they need to collaborate and I love that you made that comment John because if you remember when we did the strategic planning focus groups that's what we were talking about we were talking about innovation collaboration creativity and, and communication right so these are things that you're already seeing as a result um, but that's a great question Mike because it is something in terms of looking responsibly at our budget and our use of technology we're going to constantly be needing to reevaluate um, and he, you weren't here, so I will also repeat um, on behalf of Mr. Ghosh was that he absolutely, in his budget presentation last week, prioritized personnel. Um, and his technology rollout plan, he's put a hold on additional devices for next year in order to be able to, to make um, a reasonable request within the budget that allowed him to do what he needed to do with personnel. So what we had been talking about in terms of a rollout would have increased Chromebooks at the Hopkins School to a one-to-one, -one, and we put that on hold um, in order to be able to do the other things that he wanted to do within the budget. Can I, I Dr. McClatchy, if I'm wrong, if I'm remembering the technology discussion last week as well, but <coughs> they are also, uh, the technology decisions are also guided by the State Education Department based on some of our standardized testing because mm -hmm how those standardized tests are going to be administered mm -hmm. is also going to be necessary for us to keep in mind how the students are utilizing technology in the classroom so that they, and I liked how Bob described this last week, is that you don't want the student to be thinking about the technology and how to use the technology that they're on while they're taking one of those standardized tests because it adds stress to the situation. You want it to be seamless where they feel like they're using a pen when they're using the device. So while they're taking the test, they're worried about taking the test and not the device they're on. Mm -hmm. so that will also be part of the discussion when we're looking at technology because of the fact that the state mandated testing is going to be part of that equation. Thank you. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. So, Mr. Kernan, yes. you know, are we going to do the um, Oh, yes, the data. The sure. Well, uh, to be clear that um, you know the data that um, that Kathy has shared with you is not specifically related to uh, or not solely related to COTOT. This is really data that's around all of our students with disabilities. Co our, our students last year at, at Hopkins School, about 70% 70, 70 of our students um, with, with uh, students with disabilities were in COTOT classrooms. Um, additionally, you know, we know that COTOT um, classrooms it are, is again is not the cure all for everything and not going to fix everything there's you know in quality instruction needs to be provided we could have eight teachers in the room but if they're not teaching the right way with the right materials and the right models it's not going to be effective so we brought in a number of intervention programs and, and specialized uh, specially designed instruction so I think a combination of all of all of those things between you know shifting our, our model to co-teaching additional uh, specialized instructional uh, instruction techniques and materials, intervention materials, all of that combined to um, contribute to some of the successes that you see here. Um, I shared uh, with you some of our MCAS uh, data that relates to our accountability level. And I shared with you the last two years, 2015-2014 uh, MCAS cycles. I could have gone back a few more years, but wanted to save on paper a little bit. <laughs> um, so over the course of a couple of years, we had seen declining trends um, in the growth and achievement levels of our students with disabilities. Last year, across every one of these measures, you'll see that we've reversed trends and we've made improvements. Um, our students with disabilities in grades four and five in both ELA and math, uh, we had more students in the advanced and proficient range uh, than the year before 
and fewer kids in the needs improvement and warning range in both both grades, both subject uh, both subjects that were tested. Um, in our growth percentage, our growth percentages increased um, in both grades, ELA and math. Um, our uh, progress towards narrowing proficiency gaps improved, and our um, the progress and performance index, which combines narrowing the proficiency gaps and growth, mm -hmm. that also grew quite a bit. Um, so last year reversed um, at least, I went back four years, last year reversed three-year trends of, of declining um, performance and growth numbers. So um, I think it was a combination of changing our model, the instructional techniques that we're using, the materials that we're using, the, the, the programs that we're using to, to turn things around for our students with disabilities. So um, I think overall I, I'm really proud of our staff and more proud of our kids um, for uh, what they did last year. Um, and it's very encouraging. So. Uh, we're continuing to build on that success. This year we added two co-teaching classrooms um, to ho at Hopkins School. Um, we're continuing to bring in intervention programs and materials as well as looking at our specially designed instruction. Mm -hmm. um, we're, we're building on this momentum and um, you know I'm very proud and, and very um, pleased with what happened last year so I, I think it's a good sign of things to come. anyone have questions or comments about COTOT or these, I'm sorry, the data from Hopkins? It's self-explanatory. I don't think there were really any questions. But are they remiss to not comment that the results are really extremely impressive exactly. and a credit to you and, and, your, and your staff and all the work that's been done. So thank you for sharing. This is These are the things that we like to see, especially in this process. This is this is the value we're getting for the money we're talking about here. So I think it's important for everyone to see. I'd be remiss not to to mention my um, my right hand person, uh, Mrs. Uh, Vanessa Bellello, who uh, came to us with a special education background, and her expertise and her lens of of how to look at these look at this um, instruction. Um, how to meet the needs of our diverse needs uh, in, in the classroom, having that middle school background as well, knowing this is where the kids need to get to. Um, she has been a huge uh, benefit to Hopkins and, and Hopkinton and, and is a, a huge contributor to what we see here. Great. So. I can't wait to see you on our first full day kindergarten class. <coughs> oh, makes it to I Hopkins and we get to see that data as well. Thank you, Tim. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, Tim. Dr. Zaleski, you're on. Hello. Fantastic. Oh, my coat. Okay, okay, thank you. So, good evening. Budget that you have before you reflects. Um, those are the results of the entry plan that I conducted when I first started in the district. I conducted a needs assessment and um, analyzed all aspects of the department. And so the requests that you have before you um, reflect really the result of those needs and also um, uh, the results of my continued analysis in the department to date. Additionally, the reductions that you have before you are in alignment with, uh, to keep alignment with the priority areas. This budget also does align with the uh, district strategic plan in addition to the entry plan. So in looking at my personnel summary, we have some adjustments from FY16 to 17. Um, there were some staffing changes with uh, our out of district coordinator. There was a restructure in that area, um, an increase of the .9 FTE psychologist, and that was also part of the restructure. We added a .2 BCBA. Um, to, in, to assist with the extended day program that was put in place. At the time, there was a .5 need for a, a center school learning specialist to accommodate and support students with moderate needs, and then uh, paraprofessional support to assist with students who have come into the district with needs and existing <laughs> IEP needs. When you look at the, uh, the new positions, I'm requesting this year a .5 middle school team chair and a .5 high school team chair. And that, that replaces the um, reduction in FY16. And the reason for that replacement is we have a growing student population. In addition, we have sensitive timelines that need to be met. 
And in the process of conducting my entry plan, I recognized that the timelines were, were very intense and the ability to meet those timelines, although we were meeting them, is often difficult in the absence of those positions. Additionally, the parent community informed me that they are really seeking consistency in terms of our approach in special education during the IEP process. And in the absence of having the team chairs um, consistently in those buildings, it opened the door for several educators, special educators who have done a wonderful job of picking up the pieces and um, going to the IEP meetings. I also have related service staff running IEP meetings. And oftentimes that's confusing for families when they're at an IEP meeting and on one particular day you may have a special educator and on another you may have a related service provider running the meeting. So that request is really to enhance the IEP process and to assist us with consistency in the district. Um, I, you heard the principal speak about the intensive instructor at the center of school and I'll jump down to the um, same thing with the learning specialist at the Elmwood School. But the one position that hasn't been spoken about yet um, is the point five instructor at the high school. I'm requesting this position to assist with equitable learning opportunities for our students. Our students, particularly in the intensive classroom, the life skills classroom, um, have wonderful opportunities. And we're trying to expand our opportunities for those students to have access to other opportunities to attend courses and to um, have our ed special educators collaborate with the general educators to provide enhanced opportunities for those students. And I feel like with the addition of this .5 position, our students would have the opportunities to maybe attend an algebra course, a geometry course, or another course that they may want to attend that right now they don't have that access to attend. Um, so I feel like that would be very helpful. Um, and then two, two paraprofessionals at the middle school I'm requesting to provide equity at the grade level. Um, there is a growing need and also we have students that are serviced in the intensive environment and when those students are transitioning from the intensive environment into the inclusive, inclusive setting, they need a level of support. We don't want to transition them from you know, a higher level of support to a lower level of support without a support person. Um, we did already speak about the point five learning specialist at center two in the moderate setting. That's a reduction. Um, uh, the current need doesn't reflect the need for that position. Um, I am looking to reduce to point two in the area of um, speech and language. Um, that's based on my analysis of, of caseload and student need. Um, here you see I have a point four FTE psychologist reduction system wide, but I want to let you know that I'm seeking to make an adjustment to that um, reduction. In meeting with the principals, and as you heard them speak about social emotional service delivery and the critical need, we did a deeper dive in, in terms of the role of the BCBA versus school adjustment versus psychologist. And I really feel it may negatively impact students if we reduce psychologists. So just to clarify, because we did a lot of clarification already about guidance and adjustment, our school psychologists provide um, testing for our students. They provide group intervention, crisis intervention, um, as well as uh, a range of supports throughout the school day um, in the classroom and outside of the classroom. And while I'm going to have stationed um, BCBAs at the building level that's being requested, which is going to help with um, each building having that support person to assist in the classrooms and to provide some coaching to faculty, the psychologists play another critical role, which is providing the necessary testing that's required by legislation, but also providing the follow-up intervention to that. Because when students are tested and recommendations are made, we need to make sure that we have enough support to follow through with those, um, those obligations. And um, I feel like this layer of support to reduce it um, may impact really what we're trying to do, which is to enhance um, our, our learning for students. And I think that begins with the social-emotional realm. And if I can just jump in um, to this, um, as we know, this, this is a process. The budget is a process that culminates in January mm -hmm. with a recommendation. And so as we work through it, it, it's a moving target. But one of the things that in, in following up along with Karen and the principals, um, that is not to say that we're not going to have the same bottom line. We're just going to have to take another look and get back into the special education budget to find other places that would have less direct impact on students 
students. Mm -hmm. um, as an aside, I, I, I wanted to t explain to you what happened today in terms of being able to understand the, the involvement of the psychologists. Right. I was delighted to be able, along with Bob, to be at a PLC, so a professional learning community. It was a team meeting at the middle school. And Brian, to your point about the social emotional needs, I was so impressed with this eighth grade team who were not only participants from each content area, but the adjustment counselor and the guidance counselor were also there. They were having very deep conversations about individual students, and they do this weekly. So these, this is a team, so they travel from English to math, from science to social studies. So they see the kids in a variety of situations, but they also see them in the hallway, and they see them with their friends. And kids will leave notes on the adjustment counselor's door, I need to speak with you. Um, and they were talking so with such support and knowledge of individual students and their needs that it was, it was really wonderful to witness how much they care. One of the statements that was made at that meeting that I wrote down and then followed up with them to praise them on was, failure is not an option. That is not an option for our kids. If they are struggling, we need to figure out what to do academically, behaviorally, socially, and provide them with those supports so that they can be successful. Um, and so it just reinforced what you're saying, Karen, in a very real way that I was able to witness just, just this afternoon, um, that this is what's happening, and to remove the opportunity it's one thing to look at um, caseload. It's another thing to look at the amount of testing that takes place. But more importantly, how are we using all of these team members to address the needs of kids um, is, is what, what we've arrived at. So you'll be hearing more about this, more details on the special education budget because this has been some last minute changes. But we're anticipating being at the same place in terms of the bottom line. Thank you for that clarification. I appreciate it. Um, the, the final area in this, this category, this has been a very difficult decision, um, but I, I did make a decision to um, put out the um, idea of eliminating the ABA program coordinator position. So this position was put in place last year as a result of the growing needs that we have in the area of ABA, and we certainly do have that growing need. But what I've come to realize through my analysis is the growing need is at the building level. These children need direct service. And I, I feel like although a coordinator is a wonderful position to have as a director, to have someone managing and monitoring and helping with the data collection, we're here to service students first. And we need direct intervention at those building levels. And when we talked earlier, we spoke earlier with the principals about shared positions, my BCBAs right now are shared in the district. And um, the dilemma that poses for us is when there's a high level need at a building level and a BCBA is tied up and paged or contacted to come to a, to a situation, um, oftentimes we have to try to supplement, um, and that may mean pulling someone off lunch duty or pulling a, a guidance counselor from, from a session. And, um, and really that's not best practice. And so I, I've come to the conclusion that although it's, 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 again, a tough decision to, to lose an ABA program coordinator to assist you. Um, I need direct services at these building levels, and the kids need it. The kids need it. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm looking at the expense summary. Um, the, we had one student that entered mass school, which um, is, is new to this budget. A, uh, we've had an increase in private school and collaborative placements over the past year. Um, some students have been outplaced. We've had students move in, and then also some students, based on the um, identification of their need within the current programs that they were already placed at, have uh, switched programs based on clinical assessment of the programs that they're in. The transportation, um, the FY17 budget reflects a decrease in transportation costs. The exact figure will be determined later this month, and this results from a fixed rate agreement that this district has made with Accept Collaborative. If I could just interject, Please. I mentioned that last week. Yes. Um, we do have, we just received the, uh, the number. Okay. And it's going to go up by about $60,000. Uh, FY17's budget will still be less than FY16's budget, but you need to add about $60,000 to the bottom line. We have more kids being transported this year, which drives next year's assessment. 
Which and bottom line am I adding it to? The one that I saw last week? Yes. Okay. That's what, that's what I want to clarify. Okay. And then when we look at, uh, thank you, Ralph, when we look at the therapeutic services, this reflects an increase of $70,000. So this increase is due to um, extended day services for students we have added to our extended day programming. Um, and again, that comes out of some of our needs assessment that I conducted over the summer and analyzing the IEP process and what was lawfully required in that, in those students' um, IEPs. So we have supported the program and, and built upon it to offer a, a four-day program currently. And um, and then also uh, salaries, salary increase is, is, you know, attributing to that number. And then the 504 accommodations, um, we are able to decrease due to, to some equipment, um, no longer needing some equipment, so. Thank you. Thank you. Will the committee have any questions on the budget? Oh. Sure. Understandable. <laughs> so that's, I, and I, I understand that we're still working on it and there's yeah. some late breaking changes. Yeah. Um, but seeing mm -hmm. that this is our opportunity to actually speak with Dr. Yeah. Um, go um, for it. Um, uh, that's where I'm trying to figure out what to based on the yes. budget where it's at. The 7.39%, that's an increase over what the spend budget was last year. Mm -hmm. um, and is that strictly based on increased needs of students coming into the district, or is it based on your evaluation coming in as a new director of where our deficiencies were, or is it a mixture of both? It's absolutely a, a, a mixture of both. A, a big part of it is the collective bargaining agreement with the HDA. Uh, that's driving most of the cost increases. Yeah, so mm -hmm. we're It's, it's definitely based on current student needs and um, and current ongoing throughout the IEP process. So as you know, during the IEP process, things change, needs change, um, and we have to make adjustments in terms of what we're offering students. Additionally, students coming into the district. It's definitely related to the needs assessment and my, my asks for the new positions. For instance, the team chairs is an example of that. Um, meeting with the parent community and then various stakeholders within the community. Um, so, you know, including the BCBAs and those other positions. So, so it is a mixed analysis of a variety of factors that led to that number in conjunction with what Ralph pointed out, the, the salaries and, and um, you know, collective bargaining. Can we take a look at form two? Okay. Um, I, I think we could ask specific questions of Dr. Pileski, okay. um, because this outlines all of the all of the ins and outs. Yep. I don't know if that would be helpful. And the other, the other thing that I wanted to understand, and this is just my lack of knowledge on what is, the differences between BCBA position and ABA coordinator position, is there any overlap between those positions? So would the BCBAs be doing any of the work that the ABA program coordinator was doing this year? Or would that work be assumed by you, or where where is that work going? So it's both. So so some of the work is definitely going to be assumed by me, um, and that's you know direct oversight of the BCBAs. I'll be working to um, you know manage and monitor the paraprofessional, um, you know the, actually how we're allocating the paraprofessionals, and then what we're doing to potentially reduce paraprofessionals. Also um, you know providing professional development. I'll be um, using the support of the BCBAs to provide, and this is what the ABA coordinator was doing, some coaching. Coaching at the building level, direct support with paraprofessional staff at the building level, and then that directed intervention. So we have a model right now where we, again, we're sharing positions. So the ABA coordinator is fielding and filling in those gaps where right now we, we don't have that extra person. So. Um, 
by having the extra people at the building level, they'll absorb more of the building-based responsibilities, and I'm going to absorb the district-based responsibilities. And Lori, maybe I could ask a question that's kind of what you were getting at. Karen, uh, did the ABA coordinator uh, do any of the work that the BCBA Somewhat. I mean, again, to fill the gap, the, the ABA coordinator did definitely have to jump in at the building level. Um, for instance, if there was a need at an elementary level and, and a principal or um, an educator identified that there was a need, and we knew um, ahead of time that a need was in place for a particular day or a moment in time, I would definitely uh, reallocate and shift my program coordinator down to the building level, um, more often than not, quite frankly, to, to be up front. because I think anything that we can do to make the IEP process more simplified and <coughs> easier on the parents mm -hmm. is, is absolutely necessary based on what I hear on a monthly basis from that, from that um, group. But so my question, I guess, is related is, the, and, and this is more of my lack of special education knowledge comes into play, but the BCBAs that we're looking to add at the elementary level um, that'll be shared between the building. Will that at all help in the consistency of the IEP process? BCBAs will definitely help in, in the sense that we have BCBAs providing directed interventions and the special educators are not distracted to provide that intervention. Inevitably, that's going to solidify the process because oftentimes at the, at the meetings, it, if we have a team chair, so ideal situation if this budget's approved, I'll have a team chair that's servicing for every level. And so the team chair will manage and monitor the IEP process. The special educator is always part of the team chair meeting. If I have a board certified behavior analyst that's man managing and monitoring intervention, crisis intervention, or just intervention on a daily basis, it takes away from the distraction of the educators, and, and that inevitably is going to streamline our processes so that they're not distracted and they're able to provide directed intervention to the students, and it's going to enhance the IEP process inevitably. When folks are distracted and you're, you're tied up, um, for instance, if, if I have a special educator that's on their way to an IEP meeting, meeting and there's a, an intervention that needs to take place and we don't have a BCBA at the building level and let's say a guidance counselor is out sick, that, just, that takes away from the IEP process because then I have someone else having to try and pick that up. Um, so by having these supports in place, it will, it will reduce the distractions and enhance, enhance not only the IEP process, but in my estimation, safety and the educational process as well. And so one final comment, I, I obviously have been a part of your discussions of what your entry program and entry analysis and interviews were. Mm -hmm. um, in creating these asks for the budget this year, 
how critical were the special ed teachers that are on the ground and working these processes with their individual students at this point, were they involved in, in these asks? Because I'm, I'm more trying to get at is, are they going to feel like this is helpful? Mm -hmm. um, or is this like a top-down type of thing? Because um, it, it just it realizing how stressful this area of, of the school system is, and, and, and for both parents, teachers, and and your your whole team. So I'm just trying to figure out, you know, are, would they be supportive of this as well? This accounts for a 60%. Well, because I would think this was already things that it's a good question. happen. Yeah. Okay. Question. And I wondered about private tuitions and outplacement of students. As part of your evaluation, are you looking at all outplacement? That's an ongoing, oh. ongoing discussion. So okay. my, my team chair, and she's also a school psychologist, it's a shared position, um, her and I meet monthly, and we're uh, meeting with families, and we're constantly assessing the need, and we're, um, I think we're making some great progress, um, because I feel like we have great programs here in Hopkinton, and, um, and I think the parents agree with us. We just have to work, because students that are outplaced, and they're, they're comfortable in a placement, um, sometimes we have to get them out of their comfort zone looking at the data. We look at the data and how the children are progressing. So, and then we sit with families and we re review that analysis and then we look at our programs in comparison with their programs and we make some determinations. So we are actively working on that um, and I feel like, I feel confident actually that we're going to make some progress very soon. Okay. Thank you. Um, so I only have I think one remaining question, and it's more of a, I'm not following the math. Mm -hmm. If I look at form, well, it's not the math. If I look at form two, so specifically with these middle and high school um, team chair positions, mm -hmm. so they were budgeted last year. Yeah, and they're budgeted next year, so they don't appear on form three. But we didn't, but we didn't hire them full time? What happened was we have one individual splitting the job. Between the two schools. So we effectively didn't hire a position that was budgeted last year, but we're saying even though we didn't hire it, we want to carry it to split this into two positions. That's correct. There, there was there was a uh, um, I hate to use this term, but I can't come up with another one at nine two in the evening. A, a plug uh, figure. It was called placeholder. Placeholder. <laughs> team chair reorganization. <laughs> yep. Team chair reorganization, and it was shoved into the school psychologist's account. No one really knew how, how it was all going to play out because the team chairs, in some cases, aren't just team chairs. Right. At the middle and high school, they are. But at the other schools, they're part psychologists, uh, part team chairs, part out of district coordinators, part learning specialists. So it, it's all different pieces uh, of, um, of people. So we weren't sure how it was all going to work out. But it's fair to say we, so there's an FTE in there, that basically a total FTE that we didn't hire last year that we had budgeted, but it's fair to say we yeah. used it we, right in that in that additional yeah. positions, right? I mean, okay. If you look at so, Form 2, we actually right. have more people.
actual than an FY16. Yeah. Right. Okay. So it's one of those. Okay. So it's one of those sort of tricky math things where it doesn't look like we're adding those positions, but it really is an FTE add that it comes out to. Um, okay. Thank you. I just wanted to make sure I was following along on that. I think, as I said, most of my other questions have been answered. Um, you didn't ask about circuit park. <laughs> we're expecting no, but that's 70%. And this year, the actual the number is seventy three percent. Wow. Yeah. 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 Great. Yeah. What was it last year? Uh, hold on one second. I think I can find that. I feel like it wasn't long ago. It was like thirty five percent. Yeah. It, it has changed over the years. There's no question about it. Okay, but see. Oh wait, hold on. Now this is your fault. Uh, he almost got away. Thanks, Ralph, for that. Here we go. It was 73% this year, 72% last year, 75% in 14, 74.5, 68.7, 43.6, 42. So the highest it's ever going to go is 75% because it's all subject to appropriation. So our full, what's our full offset? circuit breaker that we're putting in here guys it's it is the same as this year okay and so will that and then what are we carrying or <laughs> see that's why i didn't ask because i think this is the next week conversation goading, but yeah. you did it because this is more of a revolving account question yeah, it is. because I, i'm less of concerned with how much we're putting in the budget but how much are we saving for the stuff that doesn't yeah. he drew me into it okay um we're, we're expecting that at the end of fy 17 we will have one hundred and seventy two thousand dollars in that account okay. Okay. right now we're, we're looking at a, a balance at the end of this year 480 we expect to collect 392 and we're using 700. Okay. And that gets us to a balance of 172 at the end of next year. So that gets us a little bit of wiggle room if we need something next year. But doesn't that isn't that going to create a budget? So that's going to create a budget challenge next year. Uh, it, maybe. It, yeah, maybe. Because you've got so you've got you're basically so seven hundred thousand dollars isn't going to be there next year. Um, it depends upon who's out of district next year mm -hmm. and what they'll generate in revenue in the following year because you always get the revenue the year after you spend yeah, but if it. we're at 390 if we're saying we're expecting 390 we have 400 in there right now yeah. so we can spend 700 if we leave 170 and we get 400 again we're only at 570 if yeah. we use it all up see the good news is that if you bring kids back you yeah. save money mm -hmm. uh, on tuition but you cost yourself money in circuit breaker Mm -hmm. uh, but I'd rather have them in district and not have to pay the tuition and the transportation in the first place. Right. Okay. A again, it's a next year budgeting yeah. question potentially, but it just it seems like we're. It'll be tighter next yeah. year. It'll be, it's it's going to be tighter next year. Yeah. It's going to be. Which I'm not. I'm not. Sort of, right I'm just more year. stating as fact. It's not going to be. I'm not saying one way or the other. I mean, we have to. I, mean, I agree with the the utilization of it this year, and it seems like a hundred. Yeah. The, is a good cushion the, to keep the in. minimum the minimum you can use next year is what you're going to get this year right so that number would be about 550 so that by law you have to use within one year of receiving it so um, the, the offset has to be at least 550 okay. and we're using 700 just to try but to leaving ourselves a down. decent amount for unexpected yep. yep consistent with what we've seen in past years yep. Yep. Okay. But that's in the uh, packet that you'll get tomorrow. And it's going to save questions next week. See what you did there? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Not about any. I, no, thought, I, I think, think you're creating happen. him for the rest of us. Early. <laughs> yeah. oh, I'm good. Um, well, welcome to your first year of budget fun with the Hopkins School Committee. Um, I do have a couple of questions, and I do want to start by saying I think that what I'm seeing here you know, the advantage to fresh eyes and having a new per person in your position is being able to take a, a, a really comprehensive look at um, 
how we're providing services, and this is always the area of our budget that has the most dramatic swings, um, and in certain respects is in the least is the least in our control. Um, so I think you know what at a top level, what I'm seeing here is a focus on an increase in consistency, which is certainly something that we discussed with you um, during the interview process, and um, and so I think that that's great. I think you know, particularly with regard to the team chairs. I'm also wondering, I remember some conversation about um, transition services for students uh, as they're particularly entering high school, but in preparing for exiting our program. And I'm wondering if that's something with the increase in the team chair positions, if that's something that we're going to be able to add additional focus or support to um, for families, and if that's part of what's folded into here. The team chair position will definitely assist with that um, because if I have a team chair that's focused in one building, then certainly that person will be able to help. Um, but we're already doing that work. Mm -hmm. I've, um, through the grant writing process, I've um, brought in an expert from the, um, from the state and uh, hired as a private consultant and is working directly with us, um, has already provided training to our staff and is working directly with me and some families to enhance that process. And uh, I'm continuing to examine that um, because it is a critical need. We've identified it. The families have identified it. Um, just had a beautiful meeting yesterday to further the conversation. Um, we're actually involving Denise Hildreth and using our resources, too. She's going to provide some support to the family in the transition process in terms of the community aspect because truly transition planning involves a lot. It involves community access as well as um, in-district uh, ability to provide services and a deeper analysis of the IEP process. So I think currently through my consultancy services as well as the use of Denise and as well as my support and the team share support, um, all of those folks will be able to assist with the process. Excellent. So, um, so I think it will definitely help. Very good. And I did want, I did want to, um, to make sure everybody else is aware of your work with Denise. I think that that's really important, forging this connection with a, a stronger connection with the town. Um, particularly related to our students, our older students. Um, and I anecdotally am hearing about some really nice new programs at the high school um, for, our, for our kids, which I, to me sounded great as, as a lay person. So um, I'm you know, definitely seeing some little, little pieces everywhere um, which add up to you know, a great whole and just um, really increasing the focus particularly on consistency. And I think kind of my, my only real Big question is I'm I'm not really sure I'm seeing anything about preschool. Are we changing anything at the preschool? Are we have any changing needs, staffing needs, anything at the preschool, or is that not in here? I thought I saw it. Jean. There is there is yeah. change. Form two. Yep. Form yeah. two. Going right down. Yeah. Or maybe I just didn't see it in the overview, and I didn't. There there's uh, there's an increase of one teacher yep. between intensive and learning specialist. And that position exists today, so that's just to carry over. Okay, so we're just, uh, it's something that we've added since the last yeah. And then Paris, there's a, we increased 1.8 already this year, and we're carrying that in the next mm -hmm. year. Okay, so, so are they're settling in, it sounds like, well and well staffed at, yeah. at Elmwood. And, and, and the BCBAs mm -hmm. are very involved okay. at that program as yeah. well, um, and which is also a nice reason to have them at the Elmwood School. Yeah. Um, so. Okay, great. And then just my final um, question is about our tech classroom here mm -hmm. and how that's working. Um, Kathy has told us a little bit in other meetings about uh, how, how good of a uh, collaboration there's been between their staff and our staff, mm -hmm. but particularly because we have um, some outside observers here today, I thought if you could give us just a quick update on that. Mm -hmm. Not yeah, to put you on the spot. The but I was actually down there today. I didn't actually, they were on a break, so I didn't get to see them. They were at lunch. I popped in. Um, but I have had some dialogue with both uh, Tech and uh, Mr. K Mr. Uh, Keller in the building to find out how the program is going. It's going quite well. Um, the initial adjustment was seamless. The students just have really uh, adapted to our program and, and are accessing our uh, classrooms. And, um, and then the staff have just made a nice connection and they're, they're a resource and support um, to those students and they've really made some uh, great um, communication with the building principal and they're really a part of our culture. So it's, it's going quite well. That's great. Yeah. So for the benefit of Mr. Hearn and Mr. Manning, what we did is move the preschool to one of the elementary buildings where they had been 
for years in what used to be the cafeteria. Um, and then we were able to bring a, a program in from TAC, one of the collaboratives that we belong to, um, and they, they, they're charged rent to use the space. But then all of these benefits that come out of it, you know, both for them and for us, um, have been wonderful. The, the resources within that program and, and the level of expertise um, has been offered to us just as part of our building if we need it. So um, mm -hmm. it's, it's a win-win situation sure that also brings in some revenue to the district. Um, and and allows us to work closely with one of our collaboratives in a way that we haven't been able to in the past. Yep. You're welcome. So I have a couple of questions. Um, if I look at Form 3, Ralph, that has a total ad for new personnel of 255, <coughs> right? So is that, does that align with number two here, like to Kelly's question earlier? Um, I would prefer that you look at the FTEs. Okay. The eight FTEs. Okay. The eight. Does that eight relate to two in new position? I mean, it, it doesn't. It's more, but I think that's because the BCBA from Center Elmwood is added here, but not here. Right. Uh, she's looking at the overview. She's comparing the overview when she's pointing. I'm sorry. To form three. So we have the overview for what the SPED budget is, and then it lists the new positions. And then we have the new personnel request in the budget book that has, I guess, the new position. Mm -hmm. Right? And here we have eight new positions on this new in the budget book. But when we look for what? The overview. The overview. Mm -hmm. What's being asked for? It's less than eight. Well, uh, I, I think that uh, um, what Karen pointed out at the beginning was uh, in the personnel summary on the, uh, in the memo, mm -hmm. it talks about FY16 to FY17 adjustments. So mm -hmm. positions that were added in FY16 um, for needs that we had that weren't budgeted, those FTEs get carried over and are included in the eight. So, so this is additive of number one and number two yeah. on the personnel summary that's of correct. the summary. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's correct. Okay. And then number, then the third piece is it also uh, factors in the reductions that show up at the top of the second page on the memo. Okay. Now, I haven't added up all those bits and pieces, but they're supposed to be equal to eight. Oh no, I, I'm not worried about the math. I'm guess I'm trying to figure out. So some of what was in our school budget presentations actually ends up here mm -hmm. on Form 3 of yes, Special Ed. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. For example, the BCBA. Mm -hmm. Well, if, if, yeah. you, if you were to look at uh, Form 2, mm -hmm. uh, the teaching staff uh, that was discussed at the uh, Center Elwood and Hopkins for Special Ed uh, intensives and learning mm -hmm. specialists, show up on Form 2 for SPED. Um, the support staff, I, I'm not sure whether any of them, uh, actually none of them, or maybe the center talked about a para. Um, that is on support staff paras in SPED. Um, and then um, the BCBAs are support staff of the centralized staff on Form 2 um, that show up in there. Mm -hmm. uh, with one BCBA at the center school. Um, let's see. Uh, so one, I one BCBA system wide to replace the ABA coordinator. And then, uh, if I may, uh, another addition of a point two that was filled earlier this year, which uh, Dr. Zaleski mentioned in her, uh, her comments as well. That equals the 2.2. So, uh, BCBAs, as well as speech and language therapists, OTs and PTs, are all special ed positions that are, are considered to be system-wide positions because by their nature, uh, they get shared among the, uh, between buildings. Okay. So when Ms. Carver came and asked for the additional point five for um, the, the additional co-taught, is that the same, or are we adding another point five? Mm -hmm. the same. On, on line three, uh, on form three, 
one, two, three, four, five, six from the top. It says Learning Specialist Elmwood add a point five to enhance the co-teaching model. That is exactly what Ann Carver was talking about. So the reason why this is confusing to, to me mm -hmm. is that on Form 3, I, I do see that it shows the BCBA. And I'm going to use that as an example yes. of something I know was in um, Ms. Dubose's presentation, right? And it appears here. And then, it, but, it also, but it doesn't appear in the summary from Ms. Zaleski. The summary, not your sheet. It does. It's embedded. Rob. It's embedded. If you look at the, it's embedded with the ABA coordinator justification. So I think that might be where the confusion lies. Is okay. it's not bulleted out. Right. Right. Okay. Because the ABA coordinator would be replaced by one BCBA, and that one BCBA is not bulleted exactly. So, okay. So when we talk about special ed and what we're required to add for our student needs, and a lot of that, I. A lot of that was the adjustments to FY16 to FY17. Mm -hmm. Are there new positions in your summary that are things that we feel are required, or these are things, these are adjustments that we're making mm -hmm. um, based on needs that you see? So some based on needs, I can say um, the required, the middle school team chair, high school team chair, absolute required because of the legislation and timelines that we have to meet. Um, but with that, the teachers that we're requesting as well support that process. So the, the, the answer really is they are required to meet the needs of uh, our current student needs and also to meet our lawful obligations. I think um, mm -hmm. With the, and with the BCBAs as well to provide the intense level of service delivery because as we described before, to provide that consistency and help educators be less distracted in that process, that all helps with the ultimate lawful obligation to meet the student needs separate of the identified needs. So I guess, and maybe I'll, I'll do like full circle so you can watch so it doesn't seem my questions are so scattered. Yeah. My confusion is learning like something like the learning specialist at Elmwood to enhance co-teaching model. I get it. I think it's a great idea. Ms. Carver presented it. I don't, I don't have any problem with it. And I, and I get the need or the ask for the BCBA. But then I don't know how to compare that to the request here that says um, .5 FT intense instructor at the high school. Mm -hmm. So is one of those something that's like a special ed requirement that we need to provide to a student? And so right. that's why you're talking about it. And the other is a school-based, we'd like to have this, here's our justification for it. Mm -hmm. Or is it just a, a mixture of both? Right. Well, it is definitely a mixture. I mean, so equitable educational opportunities for students to learn is an obligation, an ethical obligation of all educators. So the point five high school, um, you know, is there specific legislation driving that I put that in right now? However, ethical educational practice to allow our students in those classrooms opportunities to, to access the curriculum is an obligation. So, um, you know, as the special education director advocating for our students and then based on the identified needs, I feel like all of it is needed and, and, and required to really adequately service our students in the department. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Mr. Manning or Mr. Hurd, do you guys have questions? So I just have uh, you know one question. This is a few years ago or two years ago, and this may be a little early to ask this question, but we had the full day kindergarten implemented one of the needs for special education because kids won't be playing catch up. I was just wondering if you, are there any trends or can you tell us anything, or do you see any improvement in the cost due to the full day kindergarten? So one of the things that um, Mrs. DeBose spoke about in terms of she was talking about the reading co-taught classroom and the results of that classroom. When we look at the kids that were placed and who were provided with that early intervention, none of those kids ended up needing an IEP. Every single one of those kids left at the end of the year on, well, sorry, one did not leave on grade level. Only one required continued services, but not on an IEP. So that's the beginning 
of some data that's very, very exciting for us. Um, I would say that we won't see any significant reductions for, so this is year two, I would say another two years because now we have the kids who had full day K, first grade, everybody in first grade coming out of full day K, right? This is the first year that's happened for teachers. So they're seeing a difference um, at the beginning of the year just based on the fact that, that kids are used to being at school all day. That they, they notice that right away. And so they're more available for learning in first grade because they come out of a full day, full day situation. Um, the numbers of kids that are moving on into the Elmwood school with those kinds of needs are reducing as well. Um, <coughs> excuse me. One of the things that we do struggle with, and it is a very real um, and, and understandable concern on the part of parents, is giving that up. So if children come out of preschool on an IEP for, for all the right reasons, and they go into a full day kindergarten, and then they go into a consistent first grade placement, and are now really functioning on grade level, um, sometimes they remain on IEP for IEPs for related services mm -hmm. only, mm -hmm. um, and that escalates the number of kids on IEPs. And I'm always asking Karen, well, so there's that many kids, but how many of them are, are receiving only OTPT, for example, speech, but they're not receiving academic support? And we need to be able to look at those differences <coughs> as well mm -hmm. as we move forward, because students may continue to need related services, but what we want to see is a reduction in the numbers of students needing academic services. Mm -hmm. So it's beginning trends. Um, we're excited about what we're seeing. And by the end of this year, we should be special education with it. We're about 13%, and that's, that's consistent. Right, but I want us to be lower than the state average mm -hmm. because um, we're, we're Hopkinton. We shouldn't be comparing ourselves to the state. Karen and I talk about this as well. Mm -hmm. It's a good comparison because you can say, okay, well, we're below the state. But it's the same thing that you heard Bob talking about comparing with the state. Um, that's a big comparison. And we should be able to have lower numbers than that given, mm -hmm. given um, the needs of our kids, the, the fact that they come to school rested and well-fed and taken care of and ready for learning um, should mean that we don't have the same as the state. Um, it is same question next year too. Yeah, <laughs> you, you, you should, and I was going to say you probably got more than you were, you know, you got me on my soapbox a little bit, but um, I, you know that I feel passionately about this and is something that uh, we're going to work on. fully understand the reporting structure of the special ed education director. Is that the correct title? Yes. <clears throat> uh, with the schools. So do all these teachers report to you or are they? So it's, it's, a, it's a shared reporting structure. So the teachers are building based. So they report to the building based administrator, which is the principals. And they also work with the assistant principals. Um, so, but I also have, you know, governance, so to speak in that um, it's a shared responsibility. So I go to some building-based meetings, I collaborate with the principals, I do collaborate with the faculty, but I, it's in a shared model. So if we have an initiative that we're working on, I'll collaborate with the principals, we'll you know, analyze and organize the, the faculty to roll out the initiative, and then we'll, we'll meet with them to carry it out. 
throughout the grant writing process, the I own that process. So I will, you know, meet with administration. I met with, you know, Bob and Kathy over the summer as I was writing grants to align with our strategic plan. And then I might embed things in there. Um, well, I'll be directly involved with t faculty as I am right now. Um, but again, it's it's a it's a shared experience um, because they have a reporting structure that's both at the building and uh, essentially really the building level. But they do have district input. Um, they they really you know respond to both of us. Um, you know, and depending on what the need is, if it's a building-based daily operational need, they'll certainly go to the building principal. Sometimes the special educators will outreach me if they feel like they want to bring in a model or they're requesting something in the department. They'll they'll come to me, and uh, and then sometimes I'll collaborate back with the principal. So. And then who do you report to? The superintendent. Okay, so straight to the superintendent. Yes. The team chairs report directly to Karen. Oh yes, they do. Yep. And the do the BCBAs the, also, the, um, or will they? They will. will yes. BCBAs and the team chairs will report directly to me. Yep. And so those are direct supervisions that, that Karen is responsible for. Brian, maybe if I could just add a little clarity. Karen directs the program and the vision. And where's that program going? Mm -hmm. The principals hold the staff accountable to following that program. So the, do the principals dotted line of her then for these types of? scenarios or these the, the student population in some cases it's a collaborative thing in some mm -hmm. cases Karen has a vision is going to sell it to the principals mm -hmm. so that's how it kind of works it way way out and my expectation is that the principals are responsible for all students and there's there's no division there um, so we, we collaborate we have an admin council that all of the principals and Karen and the assistant principals were all on together we have these kinds of conversations about student learning and data all the time. Mm -hmm. um, so we're all looking at So um, we do have reports. Responsibilities and how it works administratively. I think just so that the the community, the broader community, understands how the kids uh, with those needs get educated. Okay. And the, sort of the structure and the support structure that's there to help them. You know, we hear about the special education students, and we want to make sure that they get that equal opportunity and, and education as everyone else, along with everyone else. But I don't think people understand how it really happens. And okay. I sitting here tonight. <laughs> I think I'm more confused now than I was before, but that's okay. Mm -hmm. It's me. You know? um, I get confused. I just think it would help in the process as we talk about budget, we talk about funding, we talk about the expense, but we talk about you know, special education in Hopkinton is a big chunk of the bu education budget. Uh, and that's a conversation that's had around town. Um, so I think the okay. more that we do, the better off we'll be. And with someone that is as passionate as her about her work, meeting mm -hmm. uh, that conversation, uh, you can't go wrong. Okay, thank you. Uh, I've been in. 32 years of commercial construction meetings. I've never been to a beautiful meeting in my life, in my professional life. So <laughs> you have a beautiful meeting <laughs> doing you. what you do and Thank feeling you. that good about it. Thank you. Uh, I think that could help. Okay. Thank you. Kathy, you asked just as a good clerical question. Based on the fact that there are going to be changes to the summary for the special education budget, when will we get that updated? Because there's not going to be another presentation. No. Um, Mr. Dumas, can can we get that back out before the before we break um, for vacate for for vacation? Um, I don't know. Okay. Uh, I, I don't know. It'll be important for it to be in the packet that you'll be getting before the January eighth yes. meeting. Yes. So it'll have to be before we break. Yes. Because for next Thursday night's meeting, um, there's been no opportunity for us to think about how we're going to. No, but that will happen next week neutral. with us. Yeah. So yeah. since that's happening next week, yeah. and since I'll be getting, we will be working on an agenda for the January 8th meeting. I think it's the 8th. It couldn't be the first, so, right? 
good point. I think it's the seventh. Seven, 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 seven. So we would factor in the. Seven? Uh, I can look at my calendar. Um, whatever seven. the first meeting is, we would yeah, monitor the packet to you, and that would have the recommendation. So it would have to have the updated information. Okay. Thank you. Seventh. You're right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. It's okay. Thank you for having me. We're supposed to move to old business, um, but I, there is a member of the public here, and I didn't know if, we, if the committee wanted to agree to move public comment to before old business. Come up. Could you come up? Special ed parent. Come to the mic. Oh, sorry. Please come up. Sorry, I couldn't even hear. I'm Lanya Stancho. I'm the um, on the board of the CPAC for the town, so the parent um, advisory committee. So my question to you would be, how would you like to see that education about special ed and how it's run within the district provided to the community? Because we have a really hard time getting even our information out. So how would you like the district to do that? Because I'd love to hear it. <laughs> when you say how you get your information out, you mean the special education? Just community? our community, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I don't, I don't have the answer. I know. I was just wondering. Oh, question, that's probably why I asked the question. Yeah. Well, what, what comes to my mind in, in terms of um, listening to you, and I made note of it, Brian, was to, to provide a public forum in January between the school committee's budget recommendation and the Board of Selectmen's meetings that they have through February, March, and appropriations um, on this very question, because it's extremely informative to me f to hear you say this is what's talked about around town, that this is a big chunk of the budget, and it's what we've been working to reduce over time by some of the preventative programs that are in place. So I understand that people want to see it. I think that could be a piece of it. Um, but then hearing your response to Dr. Zaleski, your positive response, feels like here's a new SPED director. She has a vision for how eventually we can reduce some of these, these costs, but also at the same time how we can increase services for students. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of great things going on. Maybe it's somewhere in there and we can somehow get collaboration between the school department and the town um, to really, really talk this up. Right, so that people know what's happening. Come listen to the, listen to the presentation. Have your questions answered. Um, I think that that might be an attempt that we could make um, to draw some people. I would start with the basics. You know, why do we need special education? How do we administer special education? And how do we deliver to the students in the classroom? The really fundamental stuff. Okay. Uh, and from that, you'll probably learn what other things people don't understand or don't know. And tailor the message further, you know, beyond, beyond that down the road. But I just don't think there's a, I know there's a general understanding that it's a big piece of the budget. Yeah. And people will worry about that. Sure. But I don't think there's a general understanding of how and why. Okay. Thank That's you. My one person talking. Thanks. Miss, is it Miss Stanchu, did you have, did you have a comment or question for the, the school committee or related to our discussion? Okay. All right, cause I, I don't, I mean, I feel like putting the board of selectmen on the spot is lovely, <laughs> but he's here as a liaison. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> <the> answer, <but laughs> no, I mean, as a community person, so. Yeah. Hey. Great. Okay. <laughs> okay, we're good as okay. we'll get. Okay. <laughs> 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 we'll get Mr. Uh, Rogers yeah. next. Okay, okay, great. Thank you very Thank much. You. We're moving on to um, old business. Do you guys want? We're prioritizing our capital requests. Would you guys like to stay? <laughs> yes. I don't know what I. Want. <laughs> <laughs> you want a heads up? Third consideration is the request and recommendation of the superintendent to prioritize the capital request prior to the next capital improvement committee meeting. <clears throat> we looked at this earlier and. Now there are identified priorities. Yes. 
So you, um, school committee had asked um, Mr. Dumas, Mr. Rogers, and, and Mr. Grosch did go to a CIC meeting. Um, and one of the recommendations that came out of that meeting was that it would be useful as we move forward to have a prioritized list. You had also asked us to do that. We um, wanted to in the back. There has been one addition to the list, um, which is the I don't know if you want Ralph to go through it. Yeah. Do you have any comments or questions? Why they need us to prioritize within? I mean, sort of my operating model has always been we only move forward that year. And so Having said that, the town just supported us with a new building, and certainly we don't need to be greedy and taking more than our share. But I, I mean, I don't think that this is the point. But is it that they think there's that we need to separate the wheat from the chaff here, or are we? Can I just like like a, yeah, yeah. Turn it to you. Yeah. So, for example, I wasn't at the meeting, but it was reported back to me that there was a lot of discussion about what we have itemized as our priority number three, which is the system-wide technology I upgrade, okay. and that is the, um, the need for a new student information system okay. that is really critical. It's also very expensive. So there was discussion about the fact that, well, maybe there are other ways, maybe that can wait. And so the feedback to us was, if these are top priorities that cannot wait, that prioritizing them just reinforces that even that is not anywhere floating around at the bottom. And yes, they're all priorities, but um, in, in being able to go back to talk about um, what we can't move forward without, it seemed to make, it just seemed to give it more of a priority or more of a, a need, I don't mm -hmm. know. I, mean, um, I think my Ralph sensitivity is last, is last year. Yeah. You know, we sent a list that had numbers, but we didn't necessarily vote that they were in a prioritized order. And then one was sort of dropped off and yeah. picked up. And well, it was described as it wasn't prioritized okay. by the school committee, which caught at least me by surprise and ultimately was supported by the voters and, yeah. and everything all worked out. But the, I think that, so I just wanted to be clear. Mm -hmm. I, I felt like I'm not clear going into it what their expectations are and that just I want to make sure we're all really on the same page about what we need when of we send, send it over yeah um, last year we did prioritize uh, we, you, we, we you did, did but to, yeah. to Ms. Berkman's yeah. point there was yeah. a procedural challenge yeah. when it got to the, the, the budget that was presented yeah. I know in the initial draft we saw it at uh, town hall it was there was one or two were dropped off as committee's lowest priority and we said no we're mm -hmm. still putting them forward right. um and so i just as long as we're submitting this i, I agree with the concern that i don't want to set an expectation to me prioritization is important as we think about this because as we talk as we collaborate with the town if we find that the capital picture is too aggressive and we want to be able to collaborate and work with you know work on that we have a sense of what is what is priority and what is not. But to your point about number three and noting that as number three because it is important and we do need it and we don't have another solution that we can get by, it, the, the danger is on the flip side, mm -hmm. which is what does that do to number nine? Yep. And so I, I think I'm not uncomfortable with this concept as long as when we submit it, we are clear that this is a, a committee prioritization, but that we are intending to submit all ten of these currently, mm -hmm. our intention is to submit all ten of these for the warrant. And well, so maybe maybe the motion changes to that point, John, to uh, to make it clear that well, all of these things are priorities. Well, and and to support something that you said a couple of meetings ago, and uh, 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 when we went to the joint meeting, there was discussion around um, 
nothing that's not on camp is going to be moved forward. Or I don't know if it was that strong, but that was the general um, direction. And I think you raised the point that we've been trying to have a conversation about camp, and there may very well be some of these things that are priorities for us that are not listed on the current version mm -hmm. of camp because there hasn't been an updated conversation going along the way. Um, and so that also adds to my discomfort of creating a very specific pecking order um, because I don't personally remember which ones are and are not on camp and so I think that that's another um, variable that we need to consider as we're sure. refining this. Okay. Yeah, so, so go ahead. I was go just going to ask, uh, so I, I understand the overall question that you both are asking but if there if we have individual questions on some of the items as well like is this not the time for that? I mean I guess that's where I'm also a little bit confused because mm -hmm. yeah. for instance like I, I'm fully supportive of us constructing the bus parking lot at the new school facility, mm -hmm. but I don't understand why it would be in next year's budget because the school's not going to be ready until 2018, so why wouldn't we be looking at it for that year's budget? Why is it for the yeah. next year? That's a good question. <laughs> and I'll throw this at you because we talked, we talked yeah, a little we bit about this. Yeah. Um, the best time to um, clear the land for the parking lot is while they're clearing the land for the new school. But so they wouldn't actually be constructing the parking lot at that time then since there's still going to be all this construction going yeah. on. But you, you would need to you have your appropriation in order. to at least do the clearing yeah. portion of it? That's correct. So you're saying there's a cost savings in the fact that they'll already be there doing the clearing for the school? So we're, there's a synergy there that we'd be taking advantage of and having clearing for the bus parking lot at the same time? That's correct. Well, and you'd have potential additional delays if you waited because you wouldn't be able to clear the land while they were actually building the school. That's correct. So, so you probably wouldn't be able to even start that until post. This item and the item about the uh, buildings and grounds storage facility created a bit of conversation at CIC as well for the reasons that you brought up when we uh, discussed this the last time about uh, because both of those would, you know, at least in our mind, would be at the new site. And we know that there's a new committee been formed to look at, you know, the future uses of that site and Alton Chen one of the members of CIC brought that up and I said yeah we, we're aware of that we you know wanted to have it uh, on the list for purposes of, of, of discussion uh, because we really want to get the ball rolling and that's where maybe sorry maybe it's more of rather than a prioritization list it's there's some continue to be listed yeah. right so we want to put it on there because we know the conversation's happening about the Irvine Tadaro property and this is a potential use, so we want to have it as a placeholder yeah. in, in the case that this isn't a strategy that the town deems to move forward with for that problem. Mm -hmm. yeah. we, don't want to, we don't want to chase it. Right. Okay. So the only other individual question that I have is, in reading through this list, my, my gut reaction was, why would we put the scoreboard above the storage facility? Because the storage facility is going to protect the investment we're making in the the different tractors and things that we've been discussing over the past couple of years and so I, i'm not certain why the scoreboard would trump the need to protect the machinery that we need to actually upkeep the grounds because the, the scoreboard is going to fail um it's it's in in rough shape right now and we're, we're at the end of making our repairs the the last time it's uh, we have a a, um, a board that's sent out right now and the the the, um, the person who works on it said that you know we'll be lucky if we can get this restored and, and working again on one side of the scoreboard. So um, we're we're at the end of what it, what repairs that we can make. Um, so we could be without a scoreboard if we don't. Uh, the other part about the storage facility is to your same point as the parking lot it, in that it would be um, it would be located on the new property. So that's kind of why it, it fell to the bottom, um, because we do need it. We haven't had one all this time. Um, but the, the, the only place to put it would be on, on, the, on the new building site. So, the, so I guess something that John just said now has got me a little bit confused as to who has the decision-making authority on what goes on to that property. No, no. Committee. I don't that, know. 
Okay. Yeah, but yeah. that was going to be my question uh, specific to the bus parking lot. I, I would suggest that we at least explore the conversation with the Board of Selectmen about having that be a joint article because there are financial benefits both to the town and to the schools Correct. that come out of that as well. Um, not so much for the storage facility really because we're doing the DPW at the same time so probably there isn't a resource sharing there but the bus parking lot seems to me like something that we could do <coughs> jointly with the town. So do you have a comment on a particular item or? Yeah, on the same okay. What I mean it would help sell it would be what is the revenue projection if we have the So right now it's a tax savings, but then there's also the idea that it would, that yeah, what, there's a, the excise tax, I think right. that it goes right. to Ashland. Right. right. But then there's also the issue of when we open up a bid, we'll actually, we might have competitive bids because now we only we're, 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 I'm just saying it would be an easy sell if you came Ralph, I Ralph has that information. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, yeah, it was. Here, it? Um, yeah, I, I mm -hmm. can't quite come up with it, but um, the, the only a small portion of it is is uh, um, excise tax. I think it's about fifteen thousand dollars a year in excise taxes, which the town would get. Um, the lion's share of the uh, the positive benefit is in decreased mileage for each one of the buses to go back and forth from um, Ashland to Hopkinton twice a day. Uh, that's decreased miles, decreased gasoline, uh, diesel, decreased driver hours, um, and so that all added up to, I think, in total $111,000 at the time that the memo was written. The price of diesel was a lot higher than it is now, but uh, that can be adjusted. Uh, what Ms. Scordino was mentioning was that the fact that we don't have a bus parking lot really drives down competition because um, the first thing uh, bus companies want to know is, where am I going to park my vehicles? And Connolly has a place in Ashland, and uh, we share, uh, they, they share that lot with the Ashland buses. And uh, if we had our own parking lot, I believe that it would generate some competition for the contract, which is the best way to drive your costs down. We've had one bid uh, on, on, our, on our bus bid uh, for the past few times that we've been out there. That's the one that can pay back. That, uh, Less that, than that right. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so I guess I'm I'm confused. I mean, I I hear what Jean and John are saying about not wanting to prioritize, but then I also think I mean that's life, right? You have to prioritize, and we're not. People might look at us and say, "Wait, you're really going to come to us? You're building a new school, and you want a new turf field, also." So I I think there's could be good reason to prioritize, but then I'm confused as to why. If what we're saying is the scoreboard is about to go, that ended up number eight. So now it does feel wrong to prioritize because I don't, I guess I don't understand why something that was $25,000 ended up at number eight when we're hearing, I don't know, maybe next fall it's not going to work. So are there things that were needs versus wants? So, so turf field, that's that's a we'd really like it. Maybe some people see it as a need. I don't know. We Maybe that's why it ended up at ten. Turf field. field. Well, you know that I've been tell I've been saying repeatedly to the school committee that I believe that this should be a joint article and that I think that it should be represented by multiple um, multiple groups across town and in that way it will be successful. I think the very comment that you just made, Ellen, is the one that I've been saying. We just got a school. Right. But if it is Parks and Rec, and if it is um, youth soccer, and if it is youth football, and all these groups that want the schools to have a turf field coming together to make a proposal, it's going to be successful. So I didn't ever want to own this as a request from the school department alone cause for this very reason. It's the one that's going to be easiest to say that very comment, which, I mean, I think the idea of working jointly across the town with a variety of groups that want to have access to fields is the way we should be working. Um, so but I've tried we, that. So how do we go about doing that? I've, I've been working on that, trying to bring groups of people together, 
um, all well all of last year and into this year and and we've gotten to the place where we had multiple people around the table and this is how we came up with this number which was just a feasibility and you know basically looking at different um, limitations that could be on the property etc um, and to make a joint proposal but then it ends up being an ownership thing. It ends up being an ownership thing is what it comes down to. And I don't want to get sort of us hung up at this late hour and sort of what the procedural aspect of this is, but that's a point also to when we talk about what we're trying to accomplish tonight is that even prioritized or unprioritized list that we're going to submit as, as our preliminary capital request, this isn't necessarily all going to end up on the, on the warrant or, or as is. This mm -hmm. is a process that we're going to go through between now and it's escaping me what the deadline is, but probably roughly the end of January um, to look at things like do we have partnerships to make this a joint article? Do we have, I mean, th this is, this isn't the last time we're going to take up the discussion of these. I hope so. No. <laughs> it's not even close, right? I know. I know. Yeah. This is always the most painful yeah. part of the budget process. Yeah, and it's yeah. again, it's where the prioritization comes. Because again, you, you you look at some of the things. I don't know. It's a, it's a challenge. It's a very challenging list to prioritize. I think more so than in other years because you've got the turf field factor that you just talked about. You've got the the potential storage facility and bus parking lot that we talked about that we can prioritize them all we want. There's a contingency factor there. It, it's you know. So does that does it make sense to have that at six versus another number because we don't know if I don't I, off the top of my head I don't know what the, even the timeline on the Irvine Todaro advisory group is I just wonder if we're sort of spinning in circles here when what we're really saying is if this is what we approve that these are the ten items that we're comfortable moving forward at this point in the process so, sure. so can we start this way and ones that aren't numbered 18 through 21 does anyone think those are those are in our top ten, or we don't even want to prioritize to to that degree. Yeah, those are those in FY18. You said those are FY18. Are FY18. FY18. Right. So we're not prioritizing. We no, we don't no. care about those. Before we do the the prioritization, can I ask one more question about the scoreboard? Um, have we asked the boosters if they would be willing to support that project or able to support that project? The athletic director was going to reach out. The, the answer was no because of something else that they had to put their money into, the, the doghouse? Oh. I don't know. He did. Okay. Um, I just want to make sure we had asked that question before mm -hmm. we asked the I know that he did ask that question, and I don't have, can't recall the, quest, the answer right <coughs> off the <coughs> time. If it's absolutely going to fail, that gets a lot of community use. Um, mm -hmm. I'm almost wondering, can we create categories? Like these articles are related to student safety. These articles are related to um, preservation or upkeep of equipment. The, uh, these things are about to fail. I don't know if it, does that make it easier? Then to me, it's going to be really hard to say one through 10. I don't think we're going to agree. Uh, High, low, I, medium? I mean, I yeah. think I, so I'm going to submit that I think we're too early in the process. I don't think we know enough about what the, what, what the capital is going to be from coming from the town side. I think we, I, I think we're chasing something here at this point in the process that I, I don't think we have enough information. You know, we're going to get, we're going to get a better, we're going to get a better revenue obviously a better revenue picture the closer we get to the budget the the towards the budget process we're going to have that we're going to have discussions that are going to include the town i mean we're not i i mean i think as we always are we're we're open to adjustments to this list as mm -hmm. appropriately driven by the financial picture so maybe and, and I john I, I i might suggest that if we were thinking of categories we would be thinking about these are placeholders because we need to have discussion these are absolute must haves these are placeholders that involve other committees' input before we can make a decision, and those would be the two things you said, the, the bus parking lot and the storage facility. And then this one, it, these are joint where we need other committee input, other, other committees, other interested groups. Maybe those categories could help us organize the list? I, I like that. 
because that does, that does specify exactly this is what we absolutely 100% know we need from a facilities upkeep you know, or, mm -hmm. or progression perspective. And then there are some, again, whether you want to call them contingencies, discussions, whatever. Okay. Okay. Because we're not going to, for instance, we're not going to come back and say, okay, we cannot do the boiler replacement at Hopkins. We, are we, not, we know right. that, right? That's got to be done. Mm -hmm. So. I kind of feel that way about the first four that are listed. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I just pulled one out. <laughs> and number eight. <laughs> Well, I, I don't That's know. That's the problem. The scoreboard for me is still, I, I get that it might fail, but the fact is you, you can shut out, out the score. Just score kidding. It, yeah, it would be more <laughs> embarrassing than anything. Yeah. I understand. Yeah, it's not a I'm worried about heat over the but scoreboard. I think, I think <laughs> Jean's right. point about getting a lot of community use, this was also the point that we made about the basketball and the tennis courts. Mm -hmm. All summer long, they're used every single afternoon and evening by the community. And so that was a joint article. Um, and and it, it's it's been great. So the fact that the the athletic center gets a lot of community use, and we need a functioning scoreboard, and yes, it would be embarrassing if we didn't have one, um, could make it a very logical joint article. Um, the turf field as well. So maybe that's a logic that those two could be put categorized together. The contingency ones that you've identified several times now, John, and then the rest of them are. These are must-haves. Well, I think to you can function. make the same argument about the middle school. I, you know, a lot of the um, the middle school auditorium. A lot of the yes, yes, community use. Yes, yep. a, a lot of the repairs that are um, requested or upgrades that are requested are related to community use. Big community events True. like town meeting and. Mm -hmm. um, so I I don't know I I think I I do agree with John. Um, it feels preliminary to me or else I feel like I don't clearly enough understand what their question, concern, request to us is, and so I'm uncomfortable responding to it in case we respond in a way that is somehow misunderstood or misinterpreted. I just mm -hmm. am a little gun shy based on our experience last year, which in the end worked out, but mm -hmm. there was definitely more you know, stress and confusion than there needed to be. And so can either of you address, you know, the concerns that you came away from CIC with that, that, that left you feeling we should prioritize? Well, all the other departments were asked, uh, <clears throat> you know, is, is this in the list of priority? And we made it clear going in that the school committee had not yet prioritized. So the other departments are prioritizing Higher. their capital requests separate from what the prioritization is on camp or oh I have no idea what, what's on but camp that you know for example what the fire department was asking for and there was no conversation about is it on camp is it not on camp <laughs> camp never came up in the in the okay because that was my clear understanding of the board of selection meeting. okay so are we taking no action on this item well, have we already have we already approved? We've already approved the list, right? Yeah. Yeah. Except well, except no. number eight wasn't on the right, list. Yeah, right. So the, uh, school board. So could I? Just, I'm going to suggest before I make. Just make a it. Okay. So can I make a motion then that we approve the revised preliminary um, capital improvement request list for FY17? For FY17. Yeah. Actually, that's all I'm going to put in the motion because the other stuff I think we can do just as information. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Motion by Mr. Graziano, second by Ms. Nickerson. All those in favor? Yes. Yes, yes. yes. it's unanimous and so carried. <laughs> it's just. Sorry. I can't wait to send you back. <laughs> this is your coming with me next time. Aren't you the liaison? <laughs> to what? Well, capital um, improvements. Our next meeting yeah. is Thursday, December 17th regular meeting here at the middle school library um, also a budget meeting and now I would seek a motion for adjournment so moved Seconded. motion by mr. Graziano second by Miss Nickerson all those in favor yes yes, yes. thank you all very much thank you thanks, thanks for coming thank you.